Let us go find the thing. Did I do it again where I don't know how to get it? Hold on. Somebody told me yesterday, so I'll have to look. Nope, I got it. Uh, the bottom line is, is that the, it really does seem like this plot is fairly well thought out, goes, leads back quite a ways, and uh, however you think about it, the... So I've often said that they should replace the agency with Aura, and they said that you were going to get advice from Aura in the future, and they seem to be compromising the agency. So I wonder if... Uh, I wonder if that's related. And the folks have to say in the Living Universe section, I think that is probably going to be the most impactful. She'd make a good Eve player. Uh. All right, here we go. Hello, FanFest. I'll give you a few seconds to sit down. Who was at the pub, pub call tonight, last night? Yeah. Special shout out to Capital Fusion, who I was hanging out with. See you. And Steve Ronikin, are you here? Uh, he's maybe too drunk. No. <laughs> and uh, the Abyss Watchers, are you here? No. I see you. All right, let's get this started. So something I heard yesterday was, what's the living universe? And it's basically everything that players experience after the academy. The academy is a runway into the living universe, so, and we're constantly improving that. But at the same time, we have to release stuff into, into the, them into the wild. And, and it might be easy to think about high sec, low sec, uh, null sec. It's not that simple. You're not a new player in high sec. So I'm going to quickly go through this because I assume people have seen the keynote. So if you're not, you'll have to watch that and then watch me tomorrow. I suspect that they learned uh, from the Eden. So heraldry is a way for both players and corporations to display what they want that. others to see. This is something we've talked about, promised, seen concepts before, and we're all excited about it, super excited about it. And it opens up customization like uh, beyond belief. Well, they were a specifically called out as part of West. the death list. Uh, and a fundamental for drive for that is the fact that it has to be earned. Like, it can't be bought, it's not Plex, it's not ISK. You have to earn it. And it either takes time or teamwork for collective goals, or you can't buy kill marks, that's for sure. And uh, no shortcuts. So, if you wear it, you've earned it. And quickly through this, Intibus credits will be uh, generated through activity. Can't be traded. You can just think of it as loyalty points for now. It's very similar. Or frequent flyer miles. It's a very similar topic. Um, but you'll, you'll earn it, and you'll earn Intibus credits for your corporation if you belong to it at probably a one-to-one -one ratio. The game design is is in its final stages, but that's probably the way it is. So every corporation will gain from active members doing stuff, building everything together, collective goals. Am I good? The fitting window, obviously something we need to oh, tackle Got it. to support yes. all these new cosmetics. But this is, um, I think I want to try to keep the, the, the way it is for now. So it's user-friendly, uh, user people know how it is. We don't want to create a new, another user experience. Uh, but 
earning them. Let's talk a little bit about that. It starts by doing activities in game. And uh, we want more, more players playing, doing stuff in space, and that's good for everyone. Uh, these challenges could, like, earning at Interbus could be doing literally anything. Events, challenges, uh, finishing the career program. That's something that um, they talked about yesterday, CCB Nomad. And uh, to reward good students for finishing their school and the corporations that actually recruit them while the career program is going on or afterwards. But do activities, be Omega. That will just mean that you get more credits. If you join a corporation, you contribute to the organization. And then you buy your own stuff for your own ships, for your own Interbus credits. And the corporation gets credits by having members who do stuff. If you retain them, recruit them, train them, and retain them, they'll continue generating credits for you, for those special cosmetics that you want, or heraldry. And if members convert to Omega, good for them, good for you. You spend your Interbus credits on Alliance logos for your structures or things like that. And then, ultimately, if you want to help them, you can always buy uh, Plex or Omega them for Plex that they earned together. So this is the core loop. Uh, we also want to open up manual donations to corporation, not between characters, only up. Uh, we also know that some corporations or alliances have multiple uh, corporations under their umbrella, but they still want to contribute to the alliance, so that would be possible. Sorry. And then corporation tax, and I'll talk about that. But Omega is the key. It simply multiplies the interest credits as you get. And the first activity that will grant Interbus credits is made for players by players. And I want to explain that. This is something that I'm very passionate about because it addresses the fundamental problem and unique issue of EU Online. It is a game, it is, with rewards. And being the most sophisticated player-run economy that exists, we have three things to keep in mind. We need to give out items as rewards. It's simply what we need. We want to respect the work of player manufacturers, and we don't want to disrupt the economy with uh, unnecessary ISK faucets. But we can't simply buy items from the CCP uh, player market because that would set an artificial price or floor on the, uh, for the market. So the first iteration would be to create NPC donation missions where the reward is interest credits. Now it's a choice for someone to either manufacture the items or simply buy the item from the market and donate them. Either way, the manufacturer is getting paid for their work. Uh, there's no pay but to win can't buy it with because the interbus credits are, are heraldry, and heraldry is cosmetic only, so that's never going to work. Uh, and new players really have to learn so much. And what we're doing as veterans is we're helping them, we're supplying convenience to them. They don't have to go through all of the learning before they go into space, get blown up, repeat, rinse and repeat. So we believe they would be more motivated to stick around if they have access to shifts. It's not a lie. And we're not spawning them for them. So it's you're helping confusing. them. While this has been, uh, when this has been thoroughly tested, um, there's no reason to not expand this to a much more complete suite. A fully integrated... What's up, Gaurav? So, yeah, I mean, it is... So, okay, we talked about this the other night, uh, or last night on... Uh, open comms because I was instantly nervous about this when he started to announce it. Um, cause I kind of saw its potential, especially based on what CCP Swift said during the uh, retriever thing. And my big question was, uh, if CCP is playing, is playing the middleman for selling of ships. In other words, rather than making it out of thin air, which was what our stated problem was rather, uh, we build it and turn it in and we get paid in a fake currency or in a new currency uh, and they can then sell that ship for money, would that be acceptable? And by and large, everybody ex agreed that it would because it, it, all it is is it's, uh, it, it's acting as a brokering service. We can't sell our ships for cash ourselves. They need to be able to sell, you know, pe people want to buy fitted ships because they don't understand, like in order to help them get into the game. So CCP can make their money 
and we and we can get cool new cosmetics that are funded because CCP can tie it directly to a real revenue stream, which allows it far, far more uh, ability to have resources allocated because the big wigs can see that and see how this makes them money, right, directly because they're able to sell the ships and it makes it okay for us. So um, it could very well be okay. It's just about how it's implemented. And I do like the fact that it is diegetic, right? Um, yeah. But as far as the, the ISK with the extra, extra steps thing, not exactly. Because there's a difference between me buying, it, like me going up to a, uh, an NPC market and buying a token and then activating it that's, a, that's, a, that's sold by an NPC. Uh, that would be an ISK sync because it would take that ISK completely out of the market. If I need to turn in a caracal, then uh, I can buy a caracal off the market and turn it in. That's not just getting isk for uh for uh, for interbus points that, that those extra steps are critical because somebody still had to make that caracal the comp the uh the comparative here would be tags for sec right you can go around and shoot one rat at a time and get your security status up or you can buy tags which basically represents the effort of the people who did that task for you right so you can pay somebody else to do your work for you but it's you're not paying isk for inner bus points you're paying isk to buy a caracal and then you're deciding it'd be the same as if you just un you decided to It'd be the same as if you decided to undock with it and have your other character shoot it to give yourself a free kill mark. You did not pay Isk to get that kill mark. You bought a caracal and then sacrificed that caracal to get a kill mark. Does, it, does that distinction track? I think that this is actually perfectly great. I mean, let's put it this way. If I, I still strongly say I stand by the fact that the real problem here is that the game doesn't teach our players to be comfortable with uh, with fitting things. That's the real problem, that players would rather pay an inefficient amount of cash to get a fit ship than it would be for them to know or feel comfortable fitting their own ship. That, to me, is the real issue. So we can't just ignore that issue. We need to keep working on that issue, that this is a, this, this is a, uh, it capitalizes on something that is actually wrong with the game. But knowing that, and knowing that that's not the only source of this inner best points, I think that if you're going to have this kind of solution, this is literally the only way they could have done it and had it be okay. Very system with all rewards, even skill points from the player market. And giving out more ships to new players throughout the academy. I talked about stronger organizations yesterday, and I'm going to talk uh, about they have organizational income. Um, if interbus credits are LP, and we can tax LP, that means we unlock. Time out. What did you just uh, say? Organizational income for corporations, because then we can tax a new. Where, way to fucking bury the lead, right? Hold on. So we believe they would be more motivated to stick around if they have access to shifts and we're not spawning them for them. So you're helping them. And we're not spawning them for them. While this has been, uh, when this has been thoroughly tested, um, there's no reason to not expand this to a much more complete suite. A fully integrated system with all rewards, even skill points from the player market. And giving out more ships to new players throughout the academy. I talked about stronger organizations yesterday, and I must I'm have done something wrong. Talk about oh, well. organizational oh, income. Oh, never mind. Um, if interbus credits are LP, and we can tax LP, that means we unlock uh, organizational income.
how do you have an announcement in the premise of another statement? Whatever. No. <laughs> for corporations, because then we can tax a new, or they can tax this new activity without relying on donations from those players. One dude. That's a person that does accounting for their alliance and corporation. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's one of the Aideron guys. I, I <laughs> so the reason why it's so easy to do bounties is because it's easy to tax. Uh, that's very clear. Uh, sorry. Dromsil, uh, what happened was you, you, you accidentally left a space, or it didn't leave a space between your sentence, so it went word, period, word, and the bot, or the, the system considers that it close enough to a URL. Uh, that also means that there's a unnecessary friction or kind of, I would say, pressure on corporation members to do bounties. We don't want everyone to be doing bounties and ratting for the corporation. If they could just do what they want to do and contribute automatically to the corporation, that is win-win for everyone. So we want organizations to have money because they fuel the wars, they fuel the... Uh, can the new player discounted ships from IBC be farmed by vets to sell on the market and then tank the price of, and normalize the price? Uh, the player... No, no, no. New player discounted ships, I don't believe that that's the case. It'll either be... Uh, a reward for a new player task, or more likely than not, as I said, sold on the market. So the way that the new player gets that caracal is by giving CCP five bucks. Destruction. And through SRP and pay soft bills. So that's good for the business, it's good for the game, it's good for everyone. And there's another tax that we could introduce I'll say again, CCP Thanks, is not girl. introducing this. It's an organizational tax on their members, optional. I did not know about that. So Jay. if you want to tax, uh, also, we could introduce a VAT tax. No, because the only one making money here is CCP. We're making, LP, uh, we're making this new uh, uh, interbus points. So basically try to set a uh, tax on anything that's sold on the market. So the corporation would simply take a tiny percentage of all, so whether you mine no, they're and very sell fungible. The, mine, uh, the ore, whether you take the ore and then manufacture and sell it then, or take the LP items and sell them, basically some part of that uh, wealth stream would be going to the corporation. Very easy, not that hard. And that's something, that's just a tool for, for your directors out there. And really, it's, it's for the, everyone in the corporation. It's not unfair because otherwise they're just going to get a bill every month to say like you own x million because I think you're looting something in in wormholes This also helps with yeah. with that management right now the problem is that the only thing they can tax so is risk. we want to strengthen public access to data uh, Currently we only have the MER which is kind of uh, you have to upload the CSVs you have to do some do some stuff you want to really want to dig into it and uh, if you're not a web developer, I am not, for example, and I have a hard time understanding the API and I, I don't have time for that. None of it's so seeded by CCP. what we're trying to do here is to give a, a structured data uh, warehouse to players at their fingertips through Excel. So you basically open Excel, get the EVE plugin from the official store, and then you have access to the same data as everyone else has. So very easy access. This will be fantastic for small and mid corporations as well. Then, one thing, we want to keep our new players, and I want to talk about high sec PvP. So, griefing is something that I'm concerned about. So, we've recently spent considerable time on, and resources on studying uh, high sec PvP. And the results are very clear. There are two main patterns of, of gameplay. So, Griefing. It's blowing up new players in new player ships with nothing in them. The attacker gains nothing, and the victim has no means to respond. Is this a real problem? Doesn't expect to be killed. Does not understand why he was killed. And from then on, bootstrapping back to into that ship will be hard and difficult for them because they don't really know what to do next. And I the guess if, for they, us if is, they encounter ventures in new player ship. cruel but fair pillar, it's simply cruel. There's nothing there. 
I, I interpreted Yankee. that as a Corvette. I was well, like, veterans eh. finishing uh, Blink, Abyss, Gila's, Orca Miners, Marauders doing missions. This is a massive reward for players. Solid idea. For a good kill. We'll, we'll start And there. the victim can choose the risk. There's plenty of ways to reduce it, but you can't eliminate it because that's not how EVE works. And they know how to bootstrap back. If they lost something, they, they'll figure it out. So the verdict on that is cruel but fair. And our efforts will almost exclusively focus on reducing the griefing aspect, not the ganking aspect. So, gankers, you're safe. Hmm. I just don't hear people complaining about their Corvette getting shot. So the living universe today, mining volume is back to historical norms. Larry can showed us yesterday. Wealth distribution and integration is also more diverse. New players are doing gas mining. There's all kinds of things that weren't there before. PI is more valuable. A lot of things are more valuable. Ratting isn't, but that was also part of the design. It doesn't mean we're stopped improving ratting, but it's not the only way to make money, especially if we introduce those organizational income pillars. Upcoming structure changes will make conflict much better, and we're seeing that in a week from now, like, or literally on next deployment. Threadnoughts are a critical part of the puzzle. They're a logical first capital and aspirational goal. They allow punching up and now at a much better rate to supers and titans. They work at home defense and they work at hunting. They can do PVE with crabs and the new experimental capital ratting sites that we have been doing. The white anchorage was the first one in December, hoping to see more very soon. And the strategic commitment is this, and I want to explain the faction warfare aspect of it. We're looking to create a more dynamic living universe. Vibrant Metropolis is one of the pillars. Faction warfare is a setting. It does not mean it's only faction warfare. It means that we want to introduce change through factions and the empires in that area of space. Structures and sovereignty. The, the best way that I figured out to think about it, I said this earlier, but just to reinforce it. Faction warfare before is a forever war uh, activity that you get to engage in in order to push button, receive bacon, right? What Faction Warfare is going to be is that the empires have their own drives, needs, and resources, and you will be the, the tool by which their will is exacted within the universe. That is the difference in concept. are still the key elements of going forward, and arcs are simply a vehicle to deliver content through story and player activity. And we're looking at something they'll talk about later, in a few minutes. Content in this case ranges from new ships, sites, and rewards. Of course, we're not stopping to do, we're not, do not doing new ships, we're not doing sites. Everything is coming, but in a narrative flavor. See? And sometimes mystery is, is something that people look forward to. And, we and this is what I talked about yesterday quite a bit, which is that like everybody was looking for where the content was. And the problem is, is that the content is all in the shit that I showed you when you guys first showed up, right? Like, the thing is, is this, a lot of, as a, as a gamer or whatever, um, just on its classic sense, it, you want to have patch notes, you want to have dev blogs, you want to be told as much as you possibly can. But if we're engaging in a living sci-fi universe, then, and if we're, we're really proud of the fact that we're all taking part in this story, um makes sense that things, news, changes emerge out of what's happening in the game rather than um, artificially as it has been where just in the last minute there's like one or two news posts that's kind of like explains away why the change is happening. You get what I'm saying? Uh, now, if they're going to do that, and I encourage them to do that, they're going to need to get their fucking ass in gear when it comes to getting people aware of what's happening. Scope videos are good. They're not good enough. You know what I mean? Like, they, they, there needs to be a way for people to be at least aware of what's going on in a common language and knowledge, right? Like, you don't need to watch every single bit, but you should know that there's a Rafik Zohar and an Esri Hakasusu and they, you know, all those sorts of things. It should start to be in your guys' faces more and more, right? Like, maybe even the news, news article, like, 
At this point, the news should show up at the very beginning. He should talk about it later on, fine. I want to keep it under wraps, but obviously there's content coming. And it's not just content for faction warfare. It seems it's going into, the, it spills into the living universe. And not just for low sec, and not just for current faction warfare players. And now, here is CCP Aurora to actually shed a lot more light on that. She asked for two hours. She only has half. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to see that most of you have woken up today. Uh, it was a struggle, I will admit. I was, uh, I was a bit nervous yesterday. Thank you for sticking with me. Uh, you guys are terrifying. <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit more about faction warfare. Yesterday I talked about it in brief, I introduced a dynamic frontline system, and today what I want to do is I want to dig in a little bit more into exactly what that means, what we're looking at. So the slides will have words today. Oh my uh, God. None of my slides had words yesterday, um, which I'm also means I have no notes. So we'll be looking at this together. Um, as I said, faction warfare is our primary focus. That doesn't mean that content won't be introduced to other areas of the game, but what it does mean is that faction warfare is the Yeah, she does talk pretty fast on her own. For example, there could be changes to NullSec, which would be introduced through a faction warfare storyline, but then spill out into the rest of the universe. She also kind of just sounds like And that. it could touch Honestly, all sorts of things, voice. whether that's structures. But I'm sure she's also we're not nervous done with them yet. everybody. We still have a lot of thoughts on structures, and they're super important. It could be territory control, um, how you control space, whether it's inside faction warfare, whether it's sovereignty, or maybe even new systems elsewhere claiming a wormhole system, claiming a high sex system. And of course, ship and fleet balance. I'll never be done with that. I, uh, I buffed the Proteus recently. Uh, Proteus is a great ship. <laughs> oh, that's the reason why she tweeted that to me. Speed subsystem, that maybe one day. That makes so much sense. And we'll be looking at all of the content in various areas of the game, especially faction warfare, because it needs it the most. But this could be uh, content in other places as well. So we're looking at updating faction warfare complexes, um, even just little tweaks, quality of life things that are really need to be done, and I'll go into that a little bit more later. New battlefield sites make it really feel like a war. Right now, faction warfare feels like you're scavenging, like it's a post-apocalyptic society, and you're like, there's like four other out here and they might hurt me, but maybe, maybe you'll run into them, maybe you won't. It doesn't feel like a war, and we want to give you that war feeling. And, as I said, it's just kind of a vehicle to introduce cool new changes overall. So, I want to talk a little bit about what I'm thinking when, when I'm looking at faction warfare. What sort of things do I have in mind? Top of the list is we want to make meaningful geography. Uh, the geography in EVE, as some people have kind of noticed over the years, the value of that has decreased. So, one system is not very different from the next system. One null sex system that you own is very similar to any other null sex system, and so it makes choosing space or fighting for a particular region that you care about a little too simple. You, you want each system to have... In Faction Warfare, it boils down to, is it a pipe system, a connected system, or a dead-end system? Does it have a station? Yes, no. That's basically it. A unique value, a strategic meaning. And so we're looking at that in faction warfare space as well. And we, wanna, we want people to be loyal to their factions. Uh, right now in faction warfare, there is a tier system uh, that is... Garbage. It results in some rather unpleasant gameplay where large groups will just kind of rapidly switch back and forth, and they washboard the faction warfare space back and forth. And we don't want that. We want you to commit to a faction. We want you to have clear goals. We want you to succeed. And, of course, we need to give Faction Warfare space some love. It really needs it. It's been a long time. Uh, I'll go into that a little bit more. Um, that said, this isn't a total rework. The core of Faction Warfare... She wasn't in Faction Warfare since 2012. ...is actually pretty cool. The fact that there's so many Faction Warfare players what? here in this audience... Whoa! Varg, Venom, thank you so much, man. Oh, seven to you, man. I'll go find my cat later and make him bite me for you. It is a testament to that. I mean, you guys wouldn't still be there if there wasn't something involved that was really valuable, and we don't want to discard that. What we want to do is we want to augment it. 
We're going to add new things on top of it, bring new people into the space, and just make it more vibrant and more healthy. And of course, we want, we want your choice to matter. Like, this is the living universe team. It's not the stagnant universe team. Uh, that would be a really weird team name for us to have. <laughs> Uh, so when you, when you achieve a victory, it should actually mean something, and there should be a clear victory. Once again, it's not just an endless tug of war side to side across the battlefield, but it's a clear objective, a clear win, a clear loss, and a clear, nice payout of rewards once you get through it. And we want, we want to bring new that. people into the, into the uh, battle, battlefield. We want players in space, and we want them to have fun. So as we're, as we're looking at all of these things that we want to do, we need to keep in mind also the things that we need to consider. Um, risk, reward, effort, balance. A lot of people talk about risk, reward, but we look at it also in terms of the, new affiliation the effort pillar, which is often day, forgotten. Day How much time did you spend setting up, rolling holes, getting everybody together, pinging your alliance, just to run like a couple C5 sites before somebody got bored and left? She's there's a reason that right content words. is a little bit more valuable, because there's a large effort component, even if your holes are rolled and the risk is not that high. I know, because I do that, what? and it's great money. <laughs> <laughs> we want to design for player interaction, and this is something that I'm really passionate about. We want to bring people together. So that's not just people in a system. I also care about all of the places in the system that people could be. So for example, if you are in an LSEC system and there are 32 anomalies, 16 structures, eight planets, 64 moons, the list can get really big. And so even though you're in a system with 100 people, it can feel quiet. You're not getting those spontaneous interactions that's that really like drive your opinion, man. And that's something that I think we should always keep in mind. How can we bring people into close proximity so that they can have meaningful and interesting interactions with each other, whether that's making friends or shooting. And of course, we want to consider different play styles. Uh, as you all know, it's really hard for us to get like very clear feedback, like this is exactly what's wrong. Well, I take that back. We get a lot of feedback that's like, this is exactly what's wrong with Eve. And then someone else uh, over is like, no, 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 it's not. Um, and so we need to consider all of these different groups that play the game and how our changes might impact them. So I had introduced an allegiance and loyalty system uh, yesterday, which is a way for us to kind of have a more binary declaration of allegiance. Right now in Faction Warfare... So that's actually a misnomer. My character was in Faction Warfare for five years, and I still can go into Kaldarian and Mars space. As long as you don't do missions, you're fine. That is a militia system. If you join an alliance that's in a in a militia, then you get entered into their militia. But we want to we want to clean that up. That's a really strange choice to have to make. Um, there's a lot of players elsewhere in the game that are part of alliances that would like to participate in faction warfare that cannot today. This is exactly what I asked for. Oof, I am. I did ask for two hours. That would have been much better. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm I'm moving along. All right. So we want NPC factions to set their own goals. So. For example, capture this system so that we can do this thing. And of course, we want you to be rewarded for them. I'll go into rewards a little bit more later, but we're effectively looking at reworking the tier system and introducing something new in its place that has better aligned incentives Good. with what players actually want to do. I'm so excited. Like, <laughs> this is. This is All like right, exactly so what I've been talking about. I talked about dynamic about. front lines yesterday. Um, there, as I said, there are oh 180 God. systems in faction warfare space, and they're all about the same. Uh, and so that's something that we want to take a look at. We want to make geography more meaningful. And this can be done in both dynamic and static ways. It wasn't like just faction The mountain warfare. range is a mountain range. It's a difficult thing to cross. But as but it is uh, a focus like an for the army next two years. invading it could technically seize control of that territory. So that would be a dynamic versus the static mountain range. And a little bit of both makes for really They said later space. on it allow you to do like pirate factions and stuff. So right the way that we're looking at these frontline empires. systems right now, you can see like the red is controlled by one team and then the blue is controlled by another. Uh, we're looking at a really simple definition at the moment, which is just if a system 
borders another system, then it is declared a frontline system. And then if a system borders a frontline, uh, but not an enemy system, then it would be declared a command operation system. Command operations would kind of have its own tactical value. Uh, that's exactly what that is yet. It's still that's being decided. But in this case, uh, one of the things that we're thinking is, what if, what if you cut off a system from it? All I know is that just thinking about that, like my real military brain just kicked in. And I was thinking about like the placement of like, here's the war zone, and then you've got your, your, your command guard. So you bring up your command guard, you place it there, and you coordinate off, and then you send in your, your dudes in order to have a fallback point, and then you've got the rear guard in the back. Holy fuck! Support. It no longer has a command operation system behind it to help feed those front lines. I hope the front that lines like have like easier to capture, and so there like could be new emerging depots where like people just got stuff all over the place. And can, oh my god! Like, uh, we're having trouble taking this, but if we cut it off, you have to bring really supplies. Cool. We can take oh that my system. God. So oh, what were the front lines today? Boost, yeah. uh, some of you will recognize Dotlan. Uh, it is a well-known player tool. I just did a really bad job in paint. Do forgive me. Uh, but what you see here in red, those are what would be the frontline systems. If we just turned on this magically today, that would be where you would find the action. That's where you would find I would like, argue the this special have been new the sites that we're looking to add ago, to them. So, you know, and you know if you're entering differ. faction warfare, you want to push those systems because they'll be more effective and you'll get better rewards. Thanks, Raiden. And then the green would be the command operation systems. At the moment, in the Amar Men Matar Faction Warfare Zone, instead of having, I don't remember what the total Fortress is, is whatever set. those numbers add up to, uh, we would have 23 frontline systems, 14 second line, which is an old term that we were using before. That would be 14 command operation systems and 33 systems which are considered rear guard. So those rear guard systems, we're what? Hold kind on. of looking at those no, why, why, why they're, no. they're entrenched. They're difficult to capture. That's just where you would, yeah. And you're going to take, it's not very rewarding to do so. It's going to be a long slog. Wait. Like that's, that's not entrenched. And 33 systems which are considered rear guard. So the rear so guard are rear the guard hardest systems, to take, which makes sense. Kind of looking at those is they're, they're entrenched. They're difficult to capture. And you're no, going to take the front it's lines not very are easier to do so. It's going to be a long because right? that's the ones we're fighting over. Like that's that's not exactly where you want to put your tactical effort. But I also don't want to entirely close the door. So maybe it would be yeah. rewardless, but <laughs> you could attack a okay. rear guard system uh, in order to gain a future strategic advantage if you thought right. that that would be beneficial. Well, I mean, it would reward, it would reward the it would reward the fact that suddenly all of the systems to, adjacent to it are now front lines, like it would it would expose their belly. That's pretty cool. And then we were going to look to layer an objective system over the top of it, so each faction would I kind call of these declare campaigns. like we need you to take this system. If you take this system, we'll achieve our goals, and it'll. Add, it'll add additional vibrance to this new frontline terrain of faction warfare space. All of a sudden, there are choke systems where there weren't previously. So that means so we this can is only be attacked sort from of Hadley's and Just talking and about Devin. the extra gameplay that we were thinking about adding to the faction warfare space. So we want to bring more people in. The existing faction warfare crowd is awesome. But you guys need some more friends. Hell yeah, we do. And so we want to we want to expand the gameplay variety. You got to well. know each other so a little bit too well. An objective might not be simply capture the system. It could also be capture the system, build the station, and hold it while we accomplish something. And then that could help us bring in new gameplay such as like war zone salvaging. There could be logistics operations where you're having to like bring supplies to the front lines in order to support them. It adds a whole lot of new vibrancy on top of the existing gameplay where you're still trying to fight and capture and control systems. Exactly what this will be, still yet to be determined. We're very much in the exploration phase at the moment. Uh, so I've had a lot of conversations. I'm about to get a whole lot more at that Faction Warfare Roundtable, I'm sure. Um, but if you have ideas, things that you think would work well, things that you have concerns about, now's the time to ask them so that I can make sure that those thoughts make it into our 
uh, designs, which will be happening. Right, the next reward week. system is backwards right now, for sure. And of course, I said that faction warfare needs some love. So there are a number of issues. Uh, up all structures in faction warfare space are not great because the meaningful control of that territory was somewhat undermined by allowing enemy militias to simply still have perfectly fine tether and docking access Which they don't in have space that you control. So that's absolutely Wait, yes. something we want to take a look at. Uh, we want to True kind of look complexes. at complexes. So the current complex design is rather simple. Like, can we, can we make it so that pirate ships can't enter novice complexes, for example? That would be really satisfying to those people who can't afford pirate ships. <laughs> Like myself, most so of the time. So just faction or uh, tech, tech one and navy. I like. And it. can we can we kind of shift things so that there's extra value for navy ships? Value for navy ships is a really big thing. Navy ships are really cool, but sometimes they get overshadowed. Dunk like, the how fucking two system. Those brighter? Nobody gets Apparently, there's a mouse. Uh, we also want to take a look at faction warfare missions. Faction warfare missions currently do not fit well into the ecosystem of faction warfare. They're kind of a thing that non-faction warfare pilots do to extract money at the expense of reducing the value of the LP earned by people actually doing I fucking fighting love system hearing control. the correct words out of a developer's entirely, mouth. Um, but just know that it's something that we're keeping Fuck. an eye on. In particular, the tags are on my mind. I want to make sure that you can earn your faction warfare rewards. You can actually access the LP store without having to go grind for those tags in faction warfare missions if that's not exactly your thing. And we want to take a look at uh, the sites themselves. I remember when they first made these changes. What did she say, right? Uh, so the, one of the biggest problems and the reason why there's so much angst about fac faction warfare missions is that not only do they not contribute to the war zone in any way, shape, or form when it comes to actually like success or failure, but by gaining LP and gaining LP more efficiently than we, the plexers that actually quote unquote do the work, like they make so much LP that they actually devalue our work because they're making it more than us and they're doing it for nothing and it doesn't contribute to anything. They're fucking cockroaches. I've called them cockroaches forever. Um, well, that and people who like just plex in and run away when somebody shows up, but. Uh, yeah, hold on. What was it? Having to go grind for those tags. Yeah, so the tags thing is really funny because uh, when it, when I first joined, the plexes had a bunch of rats in them, and then they took the rats out. And I remember, I think it was like, um, I don't know if it was Soder or Gorski Carr. Somebody was talking about how he used to, f like, he would collect the tags, and that's how they would make money. And they're like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll, well, we'll look into it and see whether or not it matters. And yeah, the tags are worth a lot when you collect them off the dudes, but like... There is a big problem with getting, like, the, you can't necessarily go to high sec very safely, and uh, you need stuff that you can't necessarily get there in order to even access your LP. The problem with Faction Warfare and its funding, you can make tons of money as a new player, but you do, there's almost no way to bootstrap yourself into it because you need to need, you literally need to have money to make money with the LP system in faction warfare missions if that's not exactly your thing. And we want to take a look at uh, the sites themselves. So at the moment, every site is the same in terms of like how valuable it is strategically, like how much, how many... I've always said that we turn expensive people's money into b explosions. Sorry, rich people's money into explosions because we sell them faction modules and stuff and then we turn them into explosions. Three points did you earn? Whether you're running a novice in a T1 frigate or an open in a battleship. Right. That's so a problem. adding a little bit more value to those larger sites just makes sense. It rewards people for putting those larger ships on field. Speaking of rewards, we're looking at reworking them. So we're, when I say that we're looking to remove the tier system, what I mean is we're kind of getting rid of it. So it no longer will like the winning faction uh, get rewards for just having more systems. But instead, they'll get rewards for completing objectives successfully. So if you assist in completing an objective, you'll be entered into a pool of communal rewards. And then once that, whoops, sorry. What, what I really love about this is that with the idea of like finite campaigns in specific areas, what that means is that CCP could actually collate, and even if not CCP, then third party devs could do it. But like 
remember I I talked about it yesterday that, or, or earlier or whatever that I'd like it to be able to like pull up my news every morning and stuff. Well, that news could tell me the latest update of of the latest campaign, right? And it could be like you know Galente break, breakout victory, and then it could show every single person that contributed like a giant leader leaderboard because again you have a fixed point in time and a fixed point in space. The microphone's there. Once that objective it's succeeds, the only fails, thing it'll be paid out though. accordingly. At the same time, there's also, we want to reward loyalty. But yes. So win or lose, if you're sticking with the same faction, there's a track that you're working along, where as you earn rewards, you earn your loyalty. Ha, you get progress is lost. Rate. Get wrecked. And taking a little bit of a turn, um, we're also looking at structures. Uh, as we said, we're not well, done. Yeah, I mean, if, still need some love. If you can do affiliation, um, I think a lot of empires, people will agree with the next. top point. We want to ensure attacker commitment. So, at the moment, someone can show up and just shoot your citadel, and there's if they don't return, you still have to form a defense fleet. You don't know if they're coming back, and that can be a really unsatisfying thing. Nobody likes made you form. So, imagine for an example where like. In order to attack that structure, the attacker has to come in and drop like a siege structure. And that siege structure powers up and it like breaks through. Man, what if what you need to do is you need to put like these structures on all of the stargates. And as long as you have like more than half of the stargates with these special structures on them, then you can attack the things inside of that system. We could call them, I don't know, blockade units or something through the structure, which then allows them to bash it, but they can't remove it from the field, and that thing is a little bit pricey. <laughs> if they don't show up again, the defenders will simply destroy it, take a valuable uh, bit of loot out of it, and they'll get paid for having to show up and defend their structure, um, and the attackers will have lost whatever that was. Calls so whatever system units. we put in place here, we want to ensure that people are committed <laughs> when they're actually a threat to the places that you live. Now, this is not just about faction warfare. That's in general, because, like, flex There's structures aren't faction warfare. There's also some lessons that we learned from World War B. Two. Three. There I Never am. mind. Uh, Rise is still doing Talos. And, um, I mean, yeah. Uh, and Fozzy is events team. The casino roar, or whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> casino roar. <laughs> so there's, at the moment, if you, if you go and you're fighting in Nelsec warfare, and you attack a flex structure, the defender just drops another one almost immediately. And it makes it feel really pointless. So we're looking at, like, can we add a tactical window? If you take out their Ansel Black Skate, or if you take out their Sino Beacon, how, can you open a window where, you can, where it takes time for them to put it back? I want to be able to hack. OK, look, it's very simple. I want to be able to hack a Sino Beacon or a Sino Jammer. And not only does it turn it off, but it it sends out a disturbance to make it so that another one can't be turned on for a period of time until they can come and fix it. So that you can actually make use of that rather than just taking a small cash penalty for making them replace the flex structure. We're also looking at uh, capital ship retether time. Uh, I know this one's a little spicy, but at the moment there's a, there's a difference between a sub-capital ship, which has a 60-second tether time with the combat timer. When it lands on a structure, that 60 second timer is really a lot. If we look at this in terms of a HP to second metric, capital ships are totally in a different league. And so we want to make sure that that balance is reasonable. Um, so fighting on an undock can still be a thing. Like you can still put your capitals on your undock and fight. But once you untether, there's actually meaningful risk similar to that subcap risk that already exists. In general, improved gameplay and counterplay around Ansiblex skates. They're a super useful NullSec tool, but at the same time, they're also really frustrating for anyone who wants to mess with you. Uh, so the ability, there's, there's kind of two points here. Um, one is projection, which is a thing that I'm not exactly taking a look at, and the other is counterplay. If you yeah. see someone in a system, and they're on an Ansiblex skate, you don't really want to engage, because they can instantly disappear at any time. So, you know that it's not going to be successful for you, and so why would you take that risk? And of course, continue looking at pauses. So that could be. Uh, I've said this all the time. Have two uses. One is like capital storage, 
and one as day tripping into a wormhole with a, a, a cheap, hey, easy, the rapid to set up structure. So we're taking a look at that. And there's other changes we want to make as well. So as I said, these might get introduced through faction warfare, mm. but there's a lot that can be done to make Eve more fun, more so, well-rounded. Hold on, let's talk about that for just a second. So a new kind of structure that would be useful for wormholes introduced through faction warfare. If we go back to the art panel, which we're not going to do it right now, they were talking about having the new kinds of, like the smaller structures where you could like just come up and almost more up to it for the different empires. So the idea is like with this faction warfare stuff going on, there's this need for like rapidly deployable bases. And so then they develop the small, uh, uh, you know, Upwell comes up with the small uh, flex or the small, you know, whatever, Citadel. And that becomes, you know, this item. It, it comes through faction warfare. Oh, seven uh, Kaz Kazams. <laughs> Whether that's new toys and tools, for example, a damage module that like applies a damage over time effect. Something oh my God. brand new. You can, she you can't can keep saying all of my words. Close and run away, and it continues to tick down. Who knows? Purely an example. Please don't. What? What I do? What I do? Purely an example. Shit. Please don't. What? What I do? Oh sh. What I do? Purely an example. Shit. Please don't. What? What is happening? That was not good. Uh, go back to it. Oh, they ended the stream. I thought they already ended the stream. Rounded. Whatever. Whether that's We're back. I think I hit, hit the tools. back button. For example, a damage module that like applies a damage over time effect. Something brand new. You <laughs> Personal can, you operation can structure. Hit someone nice. with it if you get close enough and run away, and it continues to tick down. Who knows? Purely an example. Please don't get. Don't get too, too taken with that. Uh, and of course, balance. I want to pull up the weaker ships, and I want to, uh, you know, like the Proteus I did recently, um, and I want to reshape the dominant ones. So looking at hacks, for example, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of opinions on heavy assault cruisers. I don't want to destroy them. <laughs> uh, as much as some people would really love us to like, nerf these things into the ground, every ship should have its role. And of course, we're still looking at the tough issues. I don't have answers for you today on what Ritani talked about in terms of high set ganking, but it is something on our radar. Quality of life updates. Uh, who here would like to be able to instantly clone jump without a cooldown in an NPC station? <laughs> I know a couple people. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't take it away now. Yeah, yeah. CCP Rise is still uh, out there. More readable maps. The end game map is great, but there's a reason that I used Dotlin uh, on a previous slide. <laughs> ah. And of course, we're looking at capital ships. We want to ensure that the capital ecosystem is healthy. Every ship has its role. For example, dreadnoughts can maybe have a role in structure fights again. And every ship has its counters. So. They're, they're currently, it's, it's not terrible, but there are things that could be improved. Um, carriers are in a strange place right now where they're both overpowered and have no purpose, which is a very strange place for any ship to be in. And of course, we're looking at Navy ships. It's faction warfare time. Uh, so we want to make sure those Navy ships are valuable. We want to make sure that your LP rewards are worth it to you. And so we're going to take a look at you know, buffing the Navy ships. Armageddon Navy is terrible. <laughs> That one's on my list. Can we get a Dominic issue? And even, even more wild things. Can we add value the, to them in yeah. other ways, such as adding faction bonuses, special bonuses within faction warfare space? That would Ooh. be, of course, well balanced. Uh, for within the faction warfare space. I like the set bonus. And with that, idea. I would like to hand it back over to actually. Nope, Snorri's not taking it. Uh, CCP no, they're Emerald, buffing battleships to counter. Who is our uh, new brand manager? Typhoon fleet issue. Oh boy. Hey everybody. So great to see you all here after last night. <laughs> um, hi everybody, I'm CCP Emerald. Um, I'm new to FanFest. It's already been such an inspiring week though. I've really enjoyed getting to know you. 
I've met some of you this week, um, and I look forward to meeting more of you tonight, especially with the party at the top of the world. Who's excited? <laughs> All right, come on, come on. <laughs> All right, so uh, now that you've seen some of the incredible plans uh, coming from uh, Living Universe, uh, I wanted to take a minute to uh, walk you through how we're evolving from quadrants. So, but let's take a quick look back first. Uh, for many years, uh, expansions were released in EVE. I'm sure you remember the days where you waited right in anticipation now. for the next big expansion, all so you could finally get um, all of your cool new space toys to play with. Um, so a few years ago, we decided it was time to evolve from expansion so that we could be a little bit more flexible with our releases, um, keeping New Eden alive and dynamic. So. Eve evolved into Quadrants, and that was a two-year era. Uh, quadrants allowed us to be dynamic with our releases, ensuring that there was always a steady stream of fresh new content in Eve. And within Quadrants, uh, we told longer-term stories, as with the Triglavian Invasion trilogy. And our goal is to keep the dexterity that we've had with Quadrants, but we want to build on that foundation telling even deeper and more immersive stories, but more importantly, setting the stage for you to play a part in shaping the future of New Eden. So we're planning to roll out something new, uh, and we're calling it ARCs. I thought that the white screen, like Each for a second there, I thought like something had locked up or something. In which you play an important role. It'll feature a steady, uh, steady stream of narrative-driven events and content that lead you to a climactic moment, revealing a significant change in New Eden. I have a pretty concern. Uh, just pretty now, concern. Aurora walked you through how this might play a part in factional warfare. And in just a little bit, uh, CCP Loki is going to talk about um, the narrative behind this. No, we don't. Well, I mean, now we do. But in addition to introducing narrative arcs to Eve, we're also going to be moving towards reintroducing expansions. Aye. So but they're going quick. to look a little bit different than the expansions you're used to. So uh, actually, at the very beginning of this stream, I went over uh, a rabbit hole that I figured out today that um, the current arc that's going on with the, the Deathless and the Peacock and all these other people, like, I trace it all the way back to 2016 and the formation of the agency as in the UI that we use to get events. The reason why the agency is letting us work with the pirates right now is because, guess what? The Deathless own the agency. Um, expansions will become the major content releases in EVE. Uh, yeah, keep fucking around. We'll take Abazon, too. They will contain big content moments in arcs, oh, yeah. new features. Yeah. She's significant tech her. evolutions, art and audio enhancement, and so much more. And a lot of what you guys saw yesterday in, in, in the plans. Um, but a key difference here, and with this new era of expansions, uh, you're still going to be able to expect a steady stream of releases, seasonal events, challenges, story progression moments, and balance changes in between. So it's not going to be... Uh, uh, this isn't like epic arcs, as in like, maybe... Oh, that's a good point. I think that they're going to have a, a bit of a language issue here. Because like they're, not, I don't think they're talking about like, they're, this isn't an epic arc. What they're saying is like rather than having a quadrant where we get a trailer first and then it plays out, there's going to be a story that plays out that has a climax. And so basically, we'll go through these different story arcs over time. Uh, nothing happening in between. There's going to be plenty for you guys to do. Um, and this will um, keep New Eden active and vibrant with regular seasonal You know that events, they've had very long storylines all the way back to the beginning, right? And new storylines told through arcs. But there's going to be something big to look forward to, uh, making this really the best of both worlds. The Domain of Beyond? You can expect the first expansion moment to come in Q4 2022. Oh, we're really Thanks. excited to reveal more to you uh, then. Kai. Lord Mudokai. And But now, for the fun part, um, I'm going to hand the mic over to CCP Loki. Um, who's going to be doing a deeper dive on uh, some of the narrative development plans for this, and he's going to give you a peek at where we're, where we're headed with ARCs. Um, but let's hope he doesn't get interrupted this time. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Last night, uh, CCP Dragon was just like geeking out on CCP, CCP Loki. Good morning. No, we got new, we were going to have new content all the way up to Q4. Why are expansion. we here? True. 
falls under, we want to be entertained. When playing a game, we want to be challenged and want to be immersed in that game. And everyone here at CCP to do, should be aimed to enforce those feelings, including when including features into New Eden. When you play EVE, you should feel like you're stepping into this universe, this place called New Eden. A living universe is something that evolves and changes over time, and is constantly affected by events that take place inside it. Now, many of New Eden's most spectacular events were created by you, the Capsuleers. Over a period spanning almost 20 years now, heists and other dirty deeds have been committed, null-sec feuds and wars lasting decades have been fought, and player empires have risen and faded away. I find it fascinating that all these events become part of New Eden history and lore, and with the passage of time, they somehow become more Beta mythical or thank legendary. You for, on behalf of Izimuth and Shadow Turtle 987, thank you very much for your support, and many dude. Of you oh, seven, in sir. Here can actually say, wait for it. I was there. <laughs> I'm telling you, I was there. You know what the funny thing about this trailer is, uh, and we can look at it later if you want to. But in this trailer, like, there's a fight between the Glente and the Amar. And when it came out, everybody was, like, clowning on it because of how unrealistic it was. But this trailer was actually based on a real event that happened in the early days of EVE. But at the time that it came out, the Galente, like, hybrid weapons were at their all-time weakest. And so, like, it was totally stupid for there to be a Galente uh, fleet. But uh, now that Galente has been made strong again, it could make sense again. It's, it's, sorry. I think it's funny. I was there when we filmed it. <laughs> Oh, yep, let's not show Captain's quarters. Is to create more Quick aboard, aboard. You in the future that you can say, I was there. The feeling of taking a part in a story unfolding on a grand scale that leaves a permanent mark on New Eden. Now, uh, here Titan? we can talk, for example, about post That's win. not true. A post win was an event where you could actually affect the outcome, and it leaves like a very big permanent mark on New Eden. It's not completely scripted. It's up to you. It was up to you Captain's how it panned out. So you will be able to take an active part in determining the outcome of a lot of these events. This is how new features will be in. So this is a big thing. Like during the uh, during the Stargate event and uh, another one, people wanted to stop it, and they didn't have the capability of doing so at this point. This is the big thing about this promise. Like don't don't quote unquote hold P uh, CCP because uh, to what they did before, because I was just testing it out. What they're saying now is that from now on, it could matter. They could try to make Stargates, and we could actually stop them from happening. That's really freaking cool, just as an example. Introduced, and this is how you get the sense of belonging to your faction. This will be providing a way for you to interact with the lore and co-create it. Just release Captain's Quarters on Unreal, and now I can download it for free on my VR and just walk around it. Done. In many ways, we have done, done. all kinds of uh, these kinds of things before. For example, in the lead up to Abyssal Dead Space and the Traclavian Invasion, and taking the lessons learned from these events and experiments, we're going to do this on a much larger scale. This is why we're holding back a lot of content during this keynote. We want all the toys, whether it's ships, structures, whatever it is, like a new pirate to line? feed out throughout the arc into your hands. We are writing the story. Therefore, a narrative-driven thing is a player-driven thing. The invasions was player-driven. We determined what systems we, uh, you know, we, we took. The fighting between the players, it was a player-driven event, even though it told a narrative. Because if I would tell you, if we would tell you what is coming in the next Probably. months, it would take away all element of mystery and discovery. It would be like George Lucas in 1980 yeah, saying, yeah, you like Star Wars, I'm going to make a new enough. movie, I'm going to call it The Empire Strikes Back, and at the end of it, you're going to find out that Darth Vader is Luke's father. Oh, shit, oh, shit. sorry, sorry. Oh. Wait, I'll just what did you just say? The end of it, history and discovery. It would be like George Lucas in 1980 saying, yeah, you like Star Wars, I'm going to make a new movie, I'm going to call it The Empire Strikes Back, and oh. at the end of it, you're going to find out that Darth Vader is Luke's father. Oh, shit, oh, shit. sorry, sorry. Oh. I'll just quit now, sorry. Spoilers. <laughs> yeah. But you can say, you know, one of the lessons we learned is that you each... Every German was like, wait, that was a surprise to you? Here's the problem. Uh, I think that they lost so much goodwill from the existing community that they'll be hard-pressed to, to get them to buy in to just wait. I...
I don't think that we should be interested in necessarily winning. Like, er, we the people that are interested should be should engage with it. The people that aren't interested don't engage with it, right? Like, this game is for all kinds of different people, and hopefully, y yeah, we might lose some people that don't uh, that that are are for whatever reason. Um, but I think that we're also going to get more people because people wanted people have been wanting to be engaged in this stuff forever. Art will have a very clear beginning, climax, and a conclusion. Uh, to make this clearer, we can look at some previous um, hypothetical examples. And again, I want to emphasize, even though I'm using these as an example, we are not going to do the same thing exactly again. Each they've arc been. will feel unique, have its own storyline, own twists and plots, all own, its own custom events. What they've been doing right now is pretty good, guys. honestly. So it each gets arc better has its own awesome. story. Now, in narrative trim design, in the simplest form, we are basically introducing a feature to the narration. I mean, while this still beats patch notes, it still lacks a very like fundamental element we want to lean more into, and that's engagement with you. Uh, so, I I've said this before, okay? Like, if they give us things to do, if they give us objectives, we can choose to either do the objective or don't. But if they don't give us objectives, then we're in a dead world that doesn't give us any direction, right? So, yeah, the people that engage with it get to have the cool stuff. You get cool rewards to it, too, because of the things that we unlock through our efforts or whatever. But the point of the matter is, is that there's still, like, a universe that's changing and growing and doing things. Again, to use previous examples, in the beginning of each arc, and I want to emphasize, the first arc has already started. There are clues out there, so keep your eyes and ears open. Yeah. But each arc starts with you just thinking, what the hell is going on? <laughs> Over some period, events takes place and clues are dropped, and you have to accomplish tasks. And you are, and again, during this period, which we are in now, there is complete radio silence from us. We're not telling you that we're going to have a super start destroyer in the Empire Strikes Back. There There's a new pirate faction, it's Mimitar and Kaldari. It's OK. We, we figured it out. Later on in the discovery phase, and slowly as more objectives are achieved and more clues are revealed, your theories will, become, will sort of become closer to reality, what we're actually to, going to do. And for those of, of you who are not engaging directly and, and participating in the events, you will still get a feedback on what's going on. Eventually, new the news or the scope might clear things up or not. In this case, we actually got a Nobel Prize winner to explain how to click. We are pilots in a universe. These are empires. These are factions. These are billions of people. These are leaders with will and desires and drive and conflict. And we decide as space gods whether or not we want to assist or detract away from any given goal. If the Sorum, inv sorry, if Tash Murkon invades Sancha's stain, then we can help determine whether or not uh, Sancha is able to hold off Tash Murkon or if Tash Murkon successfully invades and takes territory in stain. That is the players making a decision based on what the empires have set in motion. It's called catalysts. This is good storytelling. This is how role-playing games work. Avian, well, how the that space works? You, people were given the chance to make things whole cloth, and they did nothing with it, and then turned to CCP and complained to them that they didn't provide him any content. Uh, but at the end of this period, CCP will break its radio silence. We will discuss the feature. We will have the usual conversation with you, as we always do, about, you know, it will come out on CC, balance issues, all those things. It's basically the first phase, which we are in now, where, the, ah. it, where we have a mystery phase, where we're not telling you anything. Oh, yeah. You need to figure this out. <laughs> I will play this, because this is, this is actually legitimately pretty funny. It's, it, it's kind of a meme, but it's pretty funny. It's a good clip. After all of the announcements yesterday, I think the community is ready to hear <laughs> what's coming next and when oh yeah i mean after all the <laughs> yesterday i think the community is ready to hear <laughs> fucking perfect the last stage is sort of race to complete co completion at this but i mean like think about it he knows it, it, he knows exactly what loki's saying right now so what do you say in his case yeah we'd love to tell you but we can't because that would spoil the fun right like but I mean, in that moment, he responds to that. It's just it's so good. Point in the arc. It has become clear what is going on and what are your faction objectives. In many cases, it would be a race between the factions to get things done. Now, 
here the goals will be extremely clear. There is no mystery. The empire will directly tell you what they want to do. Because it's an extremely important lesson from the past that when running these things, for example, I'm just going to say it out loud, like in Poshwen, right from the beginning, you should have known what's at stake when fighting for the systems and mm. what would the end result would be. We have picked up some. We, we learned sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> some of us had a pretty good clue. And during this phase, Actually, I had no idea it was going to go null sec. You might see so like surprised by that. Structure. You might see the empires on the move and... and, and, and Try to get there to do yeah, it's a high maintenance effort for them. It's almost and like it would take 33% more to development to effort, and therefore 33% more for example, money. Acquire a new technology for your faction. <laughs> this will utilize the frontline system, the allegiance system, all the things we talked about. The narrative is just tying the whole thing together and sort of just make it have a purpose. So, previous. No, what I'm hypothesizing is that this plot, in which what's happening right now is a single point of that plot will lead to, among other things, the introduction of a new pirate faction that stands to come out with their own faction line, which would be a new set of faction ships. Not that it's going to be like coming out next month or anything like that, but what they're doing is they're introducing the faction that would be perfectly poised to be that. And this is, again, just a guess of mine, but that, I'm, tr I'm using it as an example not because I'm sure of it, but because it's an example of what I think that they're talking about. Actually, again, we released these guys, and they just came out. Now, if we were doing this, you would actually have to fight for the Galante or the Kaltari, perhaps even do different things, maybe fight against each other. Yeah, I remember we did this. This is a good example. The people who turned in first got the thing first. And as CCP or Ora mentioned, got the thing first. you will have to make a long-term decision when it comes to playing, place, pledging your allegiance with a, with a faction. I'm now scared because of the Kaldari after that video, man. we want this also to spill out of factional warfare. So, for example, like I earlier know. when we were talking about the no, ships. No, no, I understand. You, if you participate in the event itself, you get extra... I'm, I'm just... Okay. I'm not, I'm not hating on people for wanting content. What I'm trying to suggest to people is you're looking in the wrong places now for doing that for your faction, but the remainder... To find out the what the content is, not to find the content. ...who are in your faction, they won't have the ship until the but faction has thankfully, my stream point. exists. And we're going to play on a lot more things than just giving things out to you. These might have, like, economy results. We're, we're sort of experimenting with all kinds of effects that we'll have on the world. We really want the empires to come alive. And while we have, like, pretty cool backstories and lore, the empires have always felt a bit stagnant in the game. They, we have factional warfare, which has been sort of in its bubble on its own. We want to make it much bigger, and we want it to spill out into the whole game. You will feel like you belong to the empire. When your empire does well, you are doing well. When your empire is doing badly, you are doing badly, up to a point. <laughs> <laughs> and again, we will see... It's a solid point that rather than just being super coy about it, It'd be really nice if all of this has been happening without us paying attention. It would have been nice for them to be more direct about it, right? Like, this was not the point to be coy. This was the point to give us at least a couple of big things, right? If they could have been like, yeah, it's the Deathless. Maybe you should look into them. Maybe you should look into their component pieces. Because think about it. I pieced that together based on shit. Like, one of the pieces of information I got was when you hover over the choice and then you can't pull that piece of information up again. So, like, how the fuck were we supposed to put this back to put it together? So it actually would have been nice for them to, like, at least basically have done what I did this morning. <laughs> you know? I would have liked more to have not had to do it. NPCs would be more That's visible during events. Uh, actually, in a game right it now, is more than you faction see some of the things that are sort of starting to wind up. We sort of started today, this morning. At Nothing we're talking about here is faction Again, warfare. Again, this is like the real world. Don't expect World War III. We are ramping slowly up. This is a journey, not a, you know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. And we're going to use the NPCs a lot to tell the story. We're going to see them fight. We're just going to do all kinds of shenanigans as usual. Just on a sure much large. bigger scale. The biggest clue I found was the co corp logo in the back. I'm trying to figure out who it is. I, I thought and it was an auto but I'm not sure As anymore. you have noticed, we have started to tell more we'll character-driven stories. Yes, And show I more noticed. of new Eaton in our videos. Over the past year, the faction leaders have become more visible, and the faction culture and traits will also continue to be more seen and felt throughout videos and other media. We sort of want to... Um, I this assume Kalari most video of you know who Sorry, Atriklav is. What's his name? Fucking fascists. Get a free Mal Malatu Shakur. 
we want to make these characters iconic. We want them you know, to be the identity of your faction. And we'll continue to see more of ships, well, it's the, uh, and station interiors, and surfaces, and planet surfaces, and so uh, brigade, uh, on. Now, are those tanks going to come into the game itself? Yeah. No, probably yeah. not. But so, these... Basically, real short, um, there are a series of uh, organizations that were part of the Dust 514 groups, these, these war clone factions. Two of them, Intara Direct Action and um, on, on a Kanobo Brigade, these are both criminal organizations, okay? Intara is a, a venal, even for Kaldari standards, the Intara family is regarded by many as a gang of cutthroats and is barely tolerated by the mega corporations. So the Intara Direct Action is basically the, the uh, legit arm of this mafia family, right? Within the state. And then the... Um, the Anakonobo Brigade is a organized crime clan within the state. So these two crime clan cr crime groups are now siding with the Sekel, uh, the Sekel clan, which the Sekel are um, the 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 Sekel are a sub faction. They're a clan within the Mimitar, or not the Mimitar, but the Thucker, and they are renegades. They're like they don't they're not even attempting to be part of the Republic. Uh, they're, they're smugglers and such. And so one of the groups that they have is known as the Sekel Expeditionary Force, which are a group that gets thrown on. They're a, they're a planetary operational specialist. That's who you send when you want to take over a planet and you're willing to pay money, and it's probably not the right thing to do. These places are a part of the EVE universe. Turns out they're all working and together. And showing them goes a long way in creating a living, breathing... And as I pointed out earlier at the very beginning, and I can go over it again, but not right now, uh, they're, they've all been working together for a very long time. Universe. This is world building. This is immersion. And, you know, hey, it's, uh, you know, a lot of it's just entertainment. I, you know, I had some fun making this one. Fun fact, when the guys come running out, that's all me. It's me in a mocap suit in my nice. house running into the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow, and we're all talking about how unrealistic up. the movements are. So and it's more What things. did that tell you? And, you know, we are just we, we are sort of getting to a place where we can speed up the process and create a lot more of these, and just we are getting better and better and better. And you know, sorry about the animation sometimes. I'm I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, again, the first arc has started. The clues are already out there. Yeah. So keep your eyes and ears open. Yes, they Here are. Here we go. They're authoritarian fascists. Absolutely. Capsuleers attending a session of the Interstellar Anti-Smuggling and Counter-Piracy Conference at the Gita Fortac Fort Trade Hub were surprised when a Concord presentation on rising smuggler activity was apparently hijacked by the very same smugglers. Platitudes. Blandishments. Lies. You of all people know that Concord and the Empires the have no interests in common with you. They have done nothing for you. They shall do nothing for you. How long will you listen to their empty words? In recent days, as is their pitiful habit, Concord has made use of you to of them, advance kid. their own agenda. These free trade outposts you have so willingly cleared of my associates have been taken over by Concord's worst, the Cero. Perhaps you don't believe me? Check Concord for yourself. Is the enemy of I have Concord broadcast the new of signatures of those sites to all. Why should you not destroy the Sorrow Bully Boys? They have always sought to control you. Don't you don't know anything about it. That should make Do you excited, man. No more. Open your eyes. Seize your destiny. And, if you would, join me, the Deathless. Embarrassed by this intrusion, Concord officials have refused to comment on... Uh, uh, do you think that well decide which null sex systems new factions will settle in like other pirate factions so what I just said wasn't a, a, um, a mistake you don't need to read a book you need to experience what's happening there's no book to read um, so Tash Mercon has been building up forces to invade into Stain. The entire Stain gate to main, uh, uh, the entire low sec gate to Stain that we considered a meme was a very specific strategic decision by Tash Mercon that she set up like over a year before that. 
on sorrow activity at occupied smuggler outposts, other than to state that measures are simply being carried out to ensure the complete eradication of illegal smuggling activities. Any recent improvements in the strained diplomatic relationship I mean, there is books between read, but you don't need to for this current and the Haldari state have been overshadowed by claims that a Galente diplomat was involved in a massive spy ring operating within the Kaldari state. The Kaldari state's chairman, Akima Kasaraki, delivered a fiery speech in a live broadcast from the Kaldari Sometimes more literal than others panel yesterday. The scheduled There's speech was reportedly originally aimed at promoting interstellar diplomacy due to the ongoing JITA 4 TAC 4 summit. However, with state corporations and citizens expressing outrage Gita, over the new oh, allegations, you. Thank you for the that. delivered speech leaned heavily into patriotic rhetoric and evoked previous hostilities with the Galente state. But you don't need to read them. We remain Kaldari. No, it's going matter on. the cost. No direct response or comments have been made by the Galente Federation so far, but Federation you live in a Navy living and Customs Forces have been placed things. on heightened alert status. You don't want to pay attention? Then that's this on you. This is Alton Hobbery. You're role-playing an aloof out-of-touch capsuleer. Congratulations. There's a lot of those out there. Okay, so the Deathless, okay? I'll do this one more time. Real quick, real quick, real quick. So the Deathless is the name of a group. It says so in the ticker that the Deathless are like the group uh, members of the Deathless attack somewhere. So the, the, the Deathless are a group. Well, back in 2016, the, the Scope News Network uh, started their own player um, uh, hiring mercenary kind of uh, system where we could be broadcasted objectives and and win rewards for doing the objectives i.e it was the very first event that had an event track and it was originally done by scope and the event was the shadow of the serpent in which we were going after the serpentis well during that time it says here the, this uh that the scope approached the dd brigadier general ordered Korachi for a statement earlier this morning as he issued a brief response while he can neither confirm nor deny sightings of the tech, he urged capsuleers to take on matters into their own hand and instead report any unusual activity to the DED. The unusual statement from General Karachi follows unconfirmed reports of a stolen copy of the FIO dossier on the Serpentis military buildup making its way into the hands of an enemy only known as the Deathless. This is the only other time that I've ever seen the Deathless be... I, I ran a search. It's never been mentioned before or after. While being confused of the, as to the exact status of the Deathless, these reports allege this identifier was recently used as the hiring for several mercenary corporations previously active on planet Shandali. With, when questioned on the matter, Karachi refused to comment. This is in 2016. So which group of mercenaries were on the planet of Shandeli? Well, mercenary corporations withdraw from Shandeli. The mercenary corporations were Intara Direct Action, Ostacon Agency, and Sekel Expeditionary Group. Intara Direct Action and Sekel Exp Expeditionary Group has been flagged specifically as being part of the de this Deathless Group, a shadow de shadowy network of smugglers linked to the Kaldarian Thucker organization. Uh, organized crime and mercenary groups have been steadily increasing its reach across New Eden. This ruthless alliance between the likes of Intara, uh, which is Intara Direct Action, Kurufar, Kurufar Organization, Anakonobo, Anakonobo Brigade, and Sekel, uh, Ex Sekel Expeditionary Group is not to be underestimated. So... Of those, Antara Direct Action and Sekel Expeditionary Group uh, are mentioned. The third group that was part of this group that was taken off of, uh, off of this planet, well, guess what? That group is the Anakono Brigade. Well, what is the Anak or Sorry, not Anakono Brigade, but the Ostacon Agency. Who are the Ostacon Agency? Well, wait, hold on. We already talked about them just a couple weeks ago. Scope News Network ownership formally divests Capsuleer job brokering business. This is one year and one month after the Serpentis event. While the details of this d deal remains confidential, insiders at Semotique Superliminal and Scope Network has it informed Impetus Interstellar News that a consortium of mercenary contracting businesses were among the top bidders for the brokerage business and technology. One source speaking with Impetus reporters via encrypted identity masking hologram provided documents indicating that this consortium included the Ostacon Agency and Intara Direct Action, private military contracting corporations. That's why I said, guess what? The agency is owned or at least manipulated by the, the Deathless. So yeah, there's a lot of clues out there already. Is this it for this? Your feedback. What's next?
And unlike WoW, 98% of EVE lore can be very easily, Google, conveniently Googled on wikis or talked about in streams like these. Uh, well, I mean, the EVE universe uh, portal is actually really good now. And I assume it's only going to get better. I will say that I found, uh, uh, well, the, the changes were made that makes them warp in slower. Um, I've been having a blast on the, uh, on the smuggler side. That's all I know. So, <laughs> for that clip is teasing from. arcs that have already started. See, he even gives uh, a good answer. We are going to go straight answer. back into the big room. Are the novels any good? To, um, um, well, so Templar 1 you can get on vo uh, book on tape. Uh, Empyrean Age and Templar 1 are both by the same author. And if you go to the Eve Universe portal and go to the top here to uh, Chronicles and go to Short Stories and come down to the bottom to Theodicy, this is a big old like 150 page PDF uh, story that is by the same author as Empyrean Age and Templar One. And so technically I would say that this is the first of the trilogy. So you could always check out Theodicy first. And uh, yes, there are books to read. You do not have to read them. Also, um, I strongly recommend uh, Eve Reader podcast evereader.org there it is so uh evereader.org does uh has done a lot of readings of different chronicles they do an amazing job we're not going to do them right now because we've got other things to do and uh recently i've started doing chronicles i did sine wave alpha already released and sine wave omega is edited i just need to be able to like or the audio is done i just need to be able to do the video which i mean you know fan fest so um, I have heard, I have not read, but I've heard that Burning Life is not necessarily worth watching or reading unless you like, it's a, it's a, it's not really a story. It's a grand tour of the different pirate factions. Uh, I liked Templar one. Um, I've read it a few times and by reading it, I mean, I listened to it on, on audible. Um, yeah. You assume that people will want to follow the backstory? Uh, No. But if you're not interested, then you don't have to pay attention to it. But now it's there, or, but it's there for the people that are. Now I cannot. I'm blanking what? on their names, but this is. I don't like it, so it shouldn't exist. No, that doesn't. I, I, I don't think that you're actually making that argument, but be careful not to. I'll put it that way. This team ought to say, talking about uh, the changes that they teased at the, at the, uh, at the keynote. Where they talk, were talking about, uh, for example, the skill changes and other such stuff that they're working on. So I want to go straight there. Thank you so much. Did I? No. I skipped over the interview part. This is the next thing. Hello, everyone. Hi. How are we all today? Rough? Not rough? <laughs> well, I hope your hogwarts are manageable, are manageable at least. I missed um, something? I'm CCP Sledgehopper. What I missed? No, hold on. Because we did a living universe and now we're doing embracing new citizens. I didn't miss anything. I'm here with CCP Edelweiss and CCP Calliope. Uh, we're all from Team Odyssey. If I feel like I'm coming off a little strong, it's because of, you know, years of hearing like very dismissive language about about the lore and being told that it doesn't matter and being told that nobody cares and being told that it doesn't have a cohesion, even though I know it does and being told that I'm wrong and being told that CCP doesn't care and all this sort of stuff. And it's just I'm glad that the shoe is on the other foot, I guess. I don't know. Let's see. Um, we're also going to be introducing Team Equinox to the stage after this uh, for more chat about the character progression and career progression. But we're here to talk to you about how we're improving the experience for newbies in EVE Online at the very beginning. Well, yeah, that's so, why I'm this is Team Odyssey. Uh, the fine folks not, you see before... No, hold on, let me be clear. I'm not saying that anyone here said that. What I'm saying is, if I'm coming off as reactionary or extra defensive, it's because of that, right? So... It's more like I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with the broader issue in response to, you know, the, 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 the stuff that's coming up. Does that make sense? I'm just, I'm owning it myself. For you are recent and current members of the team, 
Uh, we're multidisciplinary. That's part of the academy segment of EVE Online. Uh, alongside Team Equinox and Team Pathfinder. This collection of teams is working closely with one another to improve the experience of EVE Online for new players. Odyssey was formed in January 2020. We're a storyline content I, team that's yes, been tasked perfect. with creating a new experience for oh, our players. 07 Mortal the Escape, game. thank you for that. Hold so, up, actually. Who's on there? Uh, Felix? Sledgehammer. Sledgehammer's so cool. So the guy who's talking here, Sledgehammer. Oh, Ghost is on this team too. And Karker. Uh, man, that, that, that's a good lineup. Um, Sledgehammer, for those of you who don't know, the guy who's talking right here is the guy who did Invasions. Like, Invasions was his entire baby from start to finish. Formed in January 2020. We're a storyline content team that's been tasked with creating a new experience for yeah, players. Yes, Simon, go ahead and just send it to me in the background. Right. So, what are we actually doing? We're creating a character-driven narrative experience to introduce players to the world of New Eden. We're heavily, heavily storyline focused, and we want to weave the tutorialization of Eve into nice. the story and narrative. I appreciate it. Ultimately, we want to provide space for dude. new players to become comfortable in New Eden and to have the confidence to strike out and forge their own path in Eve Online. And very importantly, we're building the tools that we need to tell the story. So we briefly touched on the Node Draft editor yesterday. We're also working very closely with cinematic and art teams to create new like camera cutscene tech that we can insert into experiences. And we'll get into a little bit more about that later. So what's actually shaped our approach? What are the design pillars that we set out with? We want to deliver on the sci-fi promise of EVE Online. I'm a huge sci-fi nerd, and I think EVE is probably the best spaceship game that exists. Uh, the story should be exciting and engaging, and we want to use the story to really showcase what EVE has to offer. All the characters in the story should feel... I like have it on 1.25 uh, speed. We want to breed engagement and promote good relationships Audible. with these I characters. I should have a link so down there. We want to feel human to be well fleshed out, and Calliope's going to touch on the process that we use to create these uh, after this. We want to make sure that we validate our ideas and our assumptions early. So what we've done is partnered with player research to test all of these experiences at very, very early no, stages. Of Dragon has to we be threw isolated. prototypes together and then put it in front of user testing and gained so much valuable feedback that the quality that you see in the experience just wouldn't exist without this process. Uh, and speaking of quality, we want to set the bar for what content in EVE Online could be. Uh, uh, no, but if you decide to fa join Faction Warfare, you might be tested on your knowledge of the three books, or at least one of the three. And if you do anything in wormhole space, you might be tested on one of the three books. Or if the shooter ever comes out, you'll be tested on two of the books. Uh, I'd encourage you all to just play the air MPE. Ultimately, at the end of it, I would love for it to be the case that if a veteran decides to spin up an alt, they can see the benefit of going through the new player experience and think, yeah, I want to do this story arc. It's fun. So where did we start? I can do trivia if that would help. In September of 2021, we released the first chapter of the air MPE. And this is the attack on the air cloning facility where you've just become a new capsuleer. Right. Here you can see the air station provided to us by the wonderful dudes over in Art. Which, by the way, has uh, an it's, mysterious it's organization. Check out. You can find it in any of the of new systems in EVE Online. Uh, we want to wow the player with visuals that really showcase the capabilities of our engine. So again, working very, very closely with Art to create these wonderful sci-fi vistas, these beautiful, engaging scenes. Um, very importantly, we want to limit the possibility of the player freaking out now. Eve has many, many windows. And if we revealed all of these to the player at once, they would probably just close the client, go out, get some fresh air, have a drink, I don't know. So what we want to do is gradually reveal the UI. This is just moments after the player has uh, entered the scene. And you can see here that we have a UI highlight showing the civilian estero. What if the criminals were the, the friends we made along the way? Panel, or selected item panel, sorry. Uh, as we go through the experience, we reveal more and more of the UI so that the players gradually... That's what Eve is all about, Willie all of the interfaces that Eve has to offer. We want to hook the player with a meaningful and exciting combat experience. So we also have to consider that the player doesn't know how to fly a ship at this point. So step by step, we teach them how to move, how to interact with objects in space, and build this up until they're involved in a natural combat experience. Uh, we also really want to give them a taste of seeing like fleet battles. So we have NPC actors or MP I am going to say this though, uh, especially since CSB Dragon's right here, uh, so I know at least somebody in CCP is hearing it. I didn't mention this at all yesterday or like recently, but one of the things I've been thinking about is that there's not enough pop-up information. Not not like an actual like pop-up with a click, but like there's no, there are so many cases where you have to right-click show info that could easily be just a, a tool tip that appears when you hover over it, right? System information, station information, you know, whatever, like, like hovering over, yeah, mouse over info. Like, 
liberal use of mouse over info could fix so much of our breadcrumbing problems, it's not even funny. You can see ships in the scene that are battling in the background. Lasers, railguns, all those cool things. Uh, we expose the player to the skill window and the fitting window for the first time. Uh, you can see here, we have a highlight, a blink, on the mining laser upgrade in the player's inventory, and we have a highlight for the free slot that we want them to fit it to. So yeah. this is kind of an example of the paradigm that we set for guidance for new players. And this is present throughout the entire experience. There's a little bit of a trick to this. We can't hold their hand all the time. Or for you don't have to skip. So you don't have to, to listen to the tutorial, but it's the only advice the you get. So that it doesn't constantly feel like we're bashing players over the head with with guidance and being too heavy-handed with things. But at least at the beginning, we kind of have to be heavy-handed. The other thing that was very important for new players to understand is that you can die and it's fine. Like you lose maybe some implants, you lose, lose your ship, obviously, but death is just the beginning of a new adventure for any capsuleer. In March, we released the mining mystery, a mining adventure where you're introduced to. Elias Peltonen and the sort of industrial side of the Association for Interdisciplinary Cough. Research. Uh, what you're about to see is the first moments of the player arriving at the mining site. I think this is a wonderful showcase for all of the different components that we pull together, like the cutscene tech, the node graph to script all of this, the voice acting, conversation windows, and just quite absolutely stunning dungeon. So here you go. We're about to go into the cutscene. And this is, you know, this is one of the few occasions where you'll see something like this in EVE Online. And this is all in engine. This isn't pre-rendered. Here we have Aura explaining to the player that the scale of this operation is quite impressive for such a new co corporation. Got some pretty lasers here. We love to see asteroids getting blown up. We have Elias here in his Orca. And then we trans transition back to the interface that you're all familiar with. So. We wanted to teach the player that there's a low barrier of entry means to make a skin EVE Online. This is mining. We find asteroids in space, you can mine it, you get the ore, you can sell that ore. It's a really simple loop to teach the player. It also gave us the opportunity to introduce... My only real problem with the MPE is pacing. Like, they have video, like they have like camera scene things and they have talking, but often they will like do one and then the other. And so the pacing is really awkward. I feel like they could uh, they could smooth that together a little bit better. To the wallet for them and to I think that that's one of the reasons why a lot of people that, that do yeah, think find it boring find it boring do. because they like it just takes a we too also long obviously to get to are the next primarily thing. focused on story. So we add more mystery to this uh, encounter by means of the discovery of a wreck which bears quite a striking similarity to the ships that attacked the cloning facility in September. So what are some key takeaways from all of our releases? We're less about being a tutorial team, we're more about telling a story. We are a storyline content team. We've validated all of our experiences with early user testing, and big thanks to our external partners and our internal player researchers for this. We're developing the tools that we need instead of relying on older content systems. And we have a heavy investment in creating relatable characters and a compelling narrative journey. Players like learning, but they don't like being taught. This is true for humans as well. So why are we doing this? I'm going to pass this over to CCP Calliope, and she's going to go a little bit more into why. Well, the investment in creating relatable characters and a compelling narrative journey. Players like learning, but they don't like being taught. This is true for humans as well. So why are we doing this? I'm going to pass this over to CCP Calliope, and she's all right, fine, sorry. I said CCP Sledgehammer. Players aren't human. I'm gonna go a little bit more into why we're doing this. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Hi, I am CCP Calliope. I'm the narrative designer on Team Odyssey, and I just want to give you a little bit of insight into why we're making the decisions that we're making and to go into a little bit more detail about the fun story elements that we're adding. So as we know, New Eden is big. It's like really, really, really big. So it can be super overwhelming for someone to start their journey as a fresh capsuleer in this vast space. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they can do. The possibilities seem endless. So how do we get someone from being a tiny baby, fresh-faced capsuleer to a seasoned veteran, the kind of person who would love to come to FanFest like all of you beautiful people? Um, the way that we wanted to get our hooks into people, to get them Space hooked on this game, is, big. is through story. Really big. Now, EVE is a sandbox game, so there are 
there is a certain school of thought that says that sandbox games defy traditional linear narratives, but we do not accept that. We think that Sorry, this injection... Sorry, you, you guys didn't catch that, did you? Let me play it one more time. Developing the tools that we need instead of relying on older content systems. And we have a... Would love to come to FanFest. Like Shh. The pop decisions that were... Art of Journey. Players like learning, but they don't like being taught. This is true for humans as well. I'll say that... In creating relatable characters and a compelling narrative journey. Players like learning, but they don't like being taught. This is true for humans as well. So True for humans as well. Why are we doing this? I'm going to pass this over to CCP Calliope, and she's going to go a little bit more into why we're doing this. All right. Thank you. I'm done having fun. <laughs> okay, there we go. Hi, I am CCP Calliope. I'm the narrative designer on Team Odyssey, and I just want to give you a little bit of insight into why we're making the decisions that we're making, and to go in It's an inclusive as well. ...into a little bit more detail about the fun story elements that we're adding. So, as we know, New Eden is big. It's like really, really, really big. So it's it can be super galaxy, right, overwhelming friends. for someone to start their journey as a fresh capsuleer in this vast space. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they can do. The possibilities seem endless. So how do we get someone from being a tiny baby, fresh-faced capsuleer to a seasoned veteran, the kind of person who would love to come to FanFest, like all of you beautiful people. Um, the way that we wanted to get our hooks into people, to get them hooked on this game, is through story. Now, EVE is a sandbox game, so there, are, there is a certain school of thought that says that sandbox games defy traditional linear narratives, but we do not accept that. We think that this injection of a storyline campaign into the early player experience is critical for building that emotional investment for people. But where do we start our story? Surprisingly, we start at the beginning. As uh, CCP Sledgehammer discussed, we really want to ground players in the reality of this fiction by starting them at day one, the first day they are reborn as a capsuleer. Jeez. You wake up in your capsule for the first time, you see the way that you now exist in relation to your ship, and you are introduced to the Air Capsuleer Training Program. So this is really your absolute first moments in space. But we can't just send you out into space without any kind of anchor point. You need, you need to have an anchor in this vast world with all of its endless possibilities. Enter the Association for Interdisciplinary Research. So we knew that we wanted to create an MPC corporation that was specifically for new players, that catered to their needs, that was there to answer their questions. And the I in air is probably the most important part. It stands for interdisciplinary, and it's meant so that it can grow and evolve to meet the needs of new players, whatever they may be. Is it interesting? Um, we want to teach them combat. We have a department for that. Teach them mining. We've got a department for that. Huh. And most importantly, we have the Air Capsuleer Training Program, which can induce, introduce you to careers. And CCP Nomad is going to talk a little bit about that later. But what is Air, you ask? Air is this new corporation that positions themselves as a disruptor of New Eden's tech scene. They want people to think they're this bold new voice, they're breaking barriers, and they want to democratize the expensive and very, very risky process of becoming a capsuleer. So this is met with mixed opinions in New Eden because some people see them as this really incendiary type of organization. They're trying to disrupt the status quo. Some people are into that. You mean it's a, it's a subtle way for the Sisters of Eve in order to manipulate people even further and get their technology stuck out there while at the same time uh, giving some lucrative contracts to their parent corporation within Caldari State? Some people are not so into that. And more importantly, who is Air? As Sledgehammer mentioned, we are super keen on making this a character-driven story, so NPCs are really going to be the beating heart. We don't want them to just serve a gameplay function. We don't just want Balin Ferris to teach you about combat. We also want him to be as integrated into the story as anything else, because you can have a clever plot, but if you don't have characters that people care about, it's all sort of for nothing. So the first of the air NPCs I want to introduce you to is a woman named Vesper Calatrix. Okay. I don't have audio? No? Okay. That's... Okay. I gotta say, this is slightly disappointing, but now I'm kind of curious because, like, my question is, who are these voice actors? The issue with using voice actors rather than, like, computer-generated sounds is it's like, what happens if you can't get them again? What happens if you have to change a word? Like, I, I won't tell the whole story, but it used to be that Autothysian Lancers were called Circadian Seekers until, they, until in one of the MPEs they voiced it and they called them Circadian Seekers, and so they had to change the name of every Circadian Seeker outside of the MPE rather than change the one inside the MPE. So Vesper is the vice president of operations for AIR. She is the charismatic ice queen archetype. She was born in the Amar Empire, Excel. but was orphaned by a blood raider attack on a ship that her family was traveling on. She was uh, 
her escape pod traveled outside of Amar space and was picked up by the Sisters of Eve, where she met the air CEO, Alita Balashirian, who is formerly of SOE, and she is voiced by the inimitable Catherine Kingsley, whose voice, unfortunately, you're not hearing today. We also have Balan Ferris. He's the commander of air security. He is the first person that you boldly go into battle with. He rose up to come back here the Minmatar Republic notes. fleet before being recruited by air. He is that stalwart, gruff, but kind military guy. He's responsible for the organization and deployment of air's paramilitary wing, and he is responsible also for the training of all air pilots. And he takes that responsibility very, very seriously. He's voiced by Ben Turner, who brought a really interesting dimension to this character. It's, it's an Osprey, no but yes. Um, but he sort of injected this uh, sort of London working class edge to his accent, which pulls that real world connotation to, into the game to sort of give you a sense of what this character's background may be like. And last of the Air NPCs so far, we have Elias Peltonen. Elias is Air's mining expert. He is the maverick. He is the kind of guy who loves money. He loves uh, adventure, travel, and just like Air, he prizes his independence because Air is like they're they're not affiliated with any empire, so oh, they seven, are icon nine, one, one. Strict, Thank you. very strict about pursuing independence and not having um, sort of tangled relationships with the other powers that be in New Eden. And I think of all of the Air NPCs, Elias might be the most fun to have a beer with, and he's in, voiced by the incredible Derek Hagen, who really. Once I said that the inspiration for Elias Peltonen's character was Brendan Fraser from The Mummy, he just took that and ran. And last, but certainly not least, for the NPCs in the air oh. NPE, we have Aura. She is your first friend in space, a stalwart companion, an unfailing ally. And as is written here, you can see that the galaxy is dark and full of terrors, but you are not alone, because she is there for you at the best of times, she's there for you at the worst of times. Um, and we really wanted Until to the over, and then she never of, talks to you again. Uh, relationship between Capsuleer and Aura. As is mentioned in the air MPE, there are thousands, if not millions, of copies of Aura in New Eden, but she is your Aura, and you are her pilot. So there's definitely a very strong relationship that we wanted to... Replace the um, agency with Aura. To really Especially since they're now corrupt. And I won't waste too much time on this slide, because uh, CCP Sledgehammer went into it, but how do we introduce Capsuleers to a world like New Eden? Violently! Now I get audio. Vectoring escape route. Evacuation sequence initiated. I still think that there should be a moment of modernity. Like you should be going through a lesson when this happens. You're like, this is great. I have time to acclimatize. What life is a like, no, you don't. You are just violently born into space um, through this exploding tunnel, and all of a sudden you're just a lonely little pod floating in space. What's going to happen to me now? Who's to say? So now what? We have this grand creative vision. We have the pursuit of a mystery well, that's um, good, that kicks Wilkin, off with the attack on the cloning facility and develops with there. the mining adventure. But how do we pull that off? So we needed, as a team, to be as interdisciplinary as air. We needed wow. to involve other teams. We needed to loop in art and audio and basically every sensory experience that goes into creating a video game. And we needed fun new tools. To talk to you a little bit about that, I'm going to hand this over to CCP Edelweiss. Thanks, CCP Calliope. Hi, FanFest. I'm CCV. I'm CCV otherwise. Uh, I'm software engineer at CCV. And OK. I'm going to take you through the first moment of V for a new player. Unable to identify our attackers, but they are not currently targeting our capsule. This gives us time to locate a ship. Finite state machine. At this point, they've created a new character. They've watched that intro video. And so they're in space. They're in a capsule. There's no UI. They've just met Aura. That's the, the plan and is to fix that, Mechios. This story, where they see a bit about the game and they learn the basics. Your pod may be able to fly through space, but like all capsules, it is unarmed. A proper ship comes with proper weaponry. The question for us in tech was, how do we guide new players in if? How Fair. do we build an interactive story? And um, the tools that we had back then were not going to cut it. They were too linear, and we really wanted players to do things on their own, to, to be able to go off the golden path. So what we came up with were these note graphs, or not the for friends. Um, you can see them here below. They're somewhat similar to um, to the visual programming from game engines like Unreal. We have actions in blue, 
Yeah, it's naughty like, or noty. Show this aura conversation or play that music trigger. And we connect them in a timeline to, for and example, this is completely event. built in house, right? CC in Dragon? red, 100%. where we're using, we're waiting for some player input, like camera rotated or yeah, camera zoomed out, and so on. So let's see it in action. We <laughs> must scan the debris for a space. The green frame the means currently active. Now let's get a better look at our surroundings. And now Aura is asking the player to zoom out, which is that uh, show conversation in blue. And we're waiting for the player to actually zoom out, which is the event in red camera zoom out. Um, and now they will zoom out. Ah. There is a ship still and you see how it advances to the You're only special in the fact that you happen to be there right then. Indeed. But what you're part of is so much bigger than you're going to... As you can imagine, there are many things that we can do with these boxes. Like, we can use them to reveal parts of the UI. You can go help us kill Sorrow. We can control the UI pointers. We can choose on one path or the other based on a condition or some player input. And by now, I believe we have yeah, all about this is already in the game. 500 different types of these boxes. So there are many options. I have highlighted the navigation section of your display. So when you were working on a Dragon, did you know that this is what it was eventually going to become? Or were you, but the main was it like an event thing that eventually that became this? we built a powerful framework to script experiences. And we're using it not just in the client, but also in the server, to control dungeon spawning, to trigger NPC behaviors. That's the plan, Kron. To give out items, etc. And um, this tool gives us the flexibility oh, Abby, they've to build that. experiences and content like you haven't seen before. And not just for new players. We want. And we are going to empower other teams within the I don't think so, Glow. Glow. That, doesn't, that isn't what it's for. So it's they can internal also tool. build more immersive content. Our next step in Team Odyssey is to use career agent missions as a test bed for bringing this technology to missions and to dungeons. And I worked in many uh, content systems in EVE, but this one. This is a big step I can just up. hit multiple overview so tabs. I'm super excited I, I forget for the everything. future. CCP's Let's Hammer. What else can we reveal? Oh, okay, cool. Okay. So it wasn't like you're making this tool using events in order to test Thank it, but you knew it was going so to be used eventually for this whole story. It's on more on like the once it got to a certain point, they're the like, hey, we should use it for this. Um, new players like the idea of exploration coming into the game. They've heard tales of a vast living sci fi universe. And they want to uncover it for themselves. They want to unravel its mysteries yeah. and sense. journey out into its unknowns. So we really want to embrace those desires with the exploration chapter. Uh, we want them to appreciate the vastness of New Eden and marvel at its celestial. What do bitter vets need? They need players. What are players? What do players need? They need to be able to be retained. What does it take for them to be retained? A good MPE and good training. They need to be able to be given confidence. They need to be given a sense of mastery. So that way they can then go and be your content and be content with you. That's what experienced players need. CCP can't give bitter vets things because whatever they give to bitter vets, they're just going to, like, CCP is the E in PVE, right? Okay, yes, they can give us cat ears. That's true. Sites. We want them to discover ancient mystery and But now I'm on the snake hat, to be armed with knowledge by the way. and skills to strike out on their own. We have the opportunity to take them on a journey filled with contextually sensitive Snake hat is greater than cat ears. Needed. We will describe how exploration complements the different careers. You know, you can hack a can, get some stuff from it. This is used by industry uh, to build or invent. And we'll teach them the basic elements of exploration as you all know them. So bookmarks, Mortal, there hacking, is new sites. scanning. Hell, new sites came out While yesterday. ensuring that all of this feels like an organic part of the story. We're going to look at career agents. 
Uh, we're delivering content periodically in both installments of their MPE, and we use the career agents as a handoff into new and proper uh, at the moment. Um, we, we're aware that there's quite a difference in quality exactly, between and seeker. our ex Air MPE experience and the career agents. So we want to use as Right, but it's being said, built up. Uh, our node graph system to introduce a guidance layer to these missions. So pointing out which ship is important here or where do I'm I interested get these to see what they do with the career agents. I thought they were uh, replacing. We want them. to move local text into. I actually kind of am okay with, with this idea. With Aura and Elias just because I thought. Oh. Uh, so the reason why I'm kind of okay with this idea is because the problem is is that the uh, Air MPE, uh, if it's allowed to go too long. Right, like the career agents allows a lot of flexibility, but the career, but the air MPE as it is, is like one long narrative. So like already by the time we're in the mining area, you can already start to feel like people might not want, like people might be falling off or might not want to be, uh, uh, might need to finish the session or whatever, right? Like so, um, the idea of having career agents still and just making them work and be good makes sense, and then having the air MPE be you know, uh, uh, a more of a, a whirlwind tour of everything. I, I don't mind that. Although I hope that when they go through the career agents, they actually like think about them rather than just one to one conversion over. Because there's some stuff in the air and then in the career agents that's just like <sighs> you're teaching some things and not teaching others. I will say that CCP has shown a lot of interest in finding out what it is that we feel uh, players aren't learning. The corp chat window is in focus by default for new players. So there's so much in local chat that can be missed in all of these mission chains that we want to surface this and highlight it. Um, this is part of like elevating uh, the text so that it's more readable, but also in mission chains where there's characters, we want to like have them in a conversation window so it doesn't feel like some chat bot that's just talking to you. Um, we're going to adjust gameplay where strictly necessary, and I want to be clear that this is just our first iteration on the career agents, and we're looking at updating the rewards if necessary. Uh, this is what Odyssey is going to focus alongside Art, uh, who are in, as you saw yesterday, and there's sure, the early stages I think of probably a next month because they kept on referring to next month's patch as being like the big one. Um, but this I don't know. is an example of Pathfinder's work on. It's her. It's the girl. I'm writing down that name. <sighs> A L P E D U R C H. That's going to take some research. On a potential mock up for. Which girl? Uh, so, okay. Uh, oh my god, 20 notifications plus. All right, so on my profile, we're going to see a lot of cat girls here for a second, okay? Just like, you know, get over it. Um, should be around here, right? Her. So uh, April 25th, it was brought to my attention that this was the logo, what, hold on, what, what's being pointed to me? Remember before FanFest you said that you'd be furious if they didn't deliver new content? You said you believe they worked on something amazing for two years, so how do you feel now? I feel like they're, they, I feel they've delivered. And I can talk about that if you want, a different time. So yeah, that's true. Sharky, Sharky brings this to me uh, and it gets us on a little journey. Um. So who is this person? Who's this suit? We tried to hunt it down for a little while. Um, and then in this video, Is it this video? Yes. So there she is right there at the bottom. She's the bartender. 
So we've been tracking her since before the uh, before Fan Fest to figure out where who she is and where she's from. I don't know if it's relevant. It's probably just a mistake, or not a mistake, but it's probably just a coincidence. It's probably like a suit of armor that they're just going to come out with soon or whatever. But uh, it is her. Iteration on the Agent Conversation UI, for instance. Uh, we want to better surface. And I'm fine, words clearer, but it was the it was the piece that I was still missing. And that I've been hunting for this entire. There's a discrepancy currently with the agent conversation window and the read details button. Some of the information is present in one and not in the other, and it's not very glanceable for the player. So we want to we want to treat that. Actually, with, I think that uh, she's the opposite. Conversation UI. If anything, she was the informant that tipped everybody off that the meeting was happening. Who genuinely got goosebumps when they announced that there was going to be an Excel integration with Eve. <laughs> um, so. Please give it up for CCP Nomad. He's going to talk to you more about the cartridge progression and career progression. Thank you very much. <laughs> Capable being the key word. This is the question Thank I've asked for, mo for months or years. What if EVE was Hello, a fun survivors. game? What if EVE could be learned through gameplay? Of FunFest Day 1. Give yourself a round of applause, guys. It's nice to see you here all. OK. So that's the topic. The factory of capable capsuleers. Character progression, player progression, core loop, and core competency. I'm CCP Nomad. I'm a sure. game designer for Team Equinox. For and all these things life. are going on to YouTube, too. Eve devs do play Eve. Go figure. Maybe I cannot compare to some of you hotshots in the audience, but I do know a thing or two. That's a beard, man. I'm part of this team, and we are... Uh, oh, there's Delegate Zero. responsible for player and character progression in EVE Online. This is a multidisciplinary team with a mix of veterans and newcomers both to CCP and to EVE. Having such a diverse team is crucial when making content and systems for new players. Okay, let's look. So what is a core loop? What it's is something loop? that you perform repeatedly. This is the basis of a It's when my module cycles, right? And you progress in the game when you manage to perform the loop faster and faster over time, or when you take on more challenging loops. Wow, that's a big game. loop. Now, some... Well, I wouldn't call that a there. core loop. I, I know. So first thing you, you set zero is on like all goal. of the teams. You, you look, what's fun to do in this game? What looks interesting to me? DZ is the, then you is the uh, George R. R. Martin of Evil Mind. Is it worth it? Then finally, you, you pick a task for that particular area of the game. Then you prepare your ship by getting the, the ship itself, the modules. Then you train the missiles, missing skills, if there are any. You then go and perform the task. You get the reward, and then you analyze what happened. Was it all good? Or maybe there's something that I can do better next time. Maybe there's a change in the fitting that would help me in this uh, adventure. So then you improve the skills, if needed, to get even better at that, and you go back to the start. Now, some of those items here are not like the others. We have player progression that's intertwined with the character progression. Both are a source of satisfaction. Actually, Mimosa, you have a be much better example of a core game loop. Why we are honestly. playing games humans. So core competency is when you can perform the core loop of the game unassisted. That is one of the things we are aiming for. We can show the player progression, character progression like this. Sometimes you are limited by your character. Thank you for that. Worst Might of noobs. Oh, seven skills, noobs. For example, or having bad standings to That's do some right. things. Drink and Other times you are limited ship. by your knowledge or lack of experience. So while character progression is explicit and measurable, 
in skill points or ESC. The player progression is much more supple. Okay, we need to go back up to 1.25, I think. Especially by new players. Our goal is to make the player progression more explicit and thus easier to comprehend and relate to. At the same time, we are making the first steps for the character progression path to be more accessible by making the initial player decisions much simpler. <laughs> and skill plans are an example of that. There's a lot so of complications with when it comes to revising missions because a lot of people don't want them to change. The story is how humans communicate. And we heard about that from Team Odyssey, from CCP, Calliope. A helpful lesson is something that you, a helpful lesson results in acquired knowledge that you can apply to get better at something. And the sooner you can apply the knowledge that you have gained, the better you retain that knowledge. It doesn't go away. Then about the guidance. We use guidance in moments Abby, that's a good one. Where we know that the player might be lost, where we set the available, where the set of available choices is too big, or where the consequences of such a choice are not clear. Well, they find out eventually, Boris. Then we have a safe environment, about. and it can, can have multiple dimensions. For example, starting the game in high sec is an example of safe environment. But also, this applies to communicating to the player that, well, that whatever choice they make, they won't regret it. So that is actually really important. <clears throat> And I want to double down on that. Um, when they talk about safety for players, it's about safety of that I know that I can make a choice and not be punished unduly for it, right? Because otherwise I get paralyzed with choice, right? So like, for instance, uh, if I have a, a, a thing of cupcakes and I say choose one, that's fine. If you know that one of them might be poisoned, now that choice is not safe. You don't feel safe making that choice. Even if there isn't one poisoned, if you know that there might be one poisoned, you don't know how to tell if one's poisoned, you still aren't safe getting any of the cupcakes. You're not safe. No one's actively coming to hunt you, but you're not safe to make that choice. So compare that to the fact that when a new player comes into the game, they know two things. One, they have no idea what the fuck's to do, and two, they're going to be punished for every little mistake they want, and everybody's trying to scam them. That's the two things that players know. So, of course, they're going to fail out. They, they, they have no direction. They have no way of feeling like they could even get to the direction. They don't know how to get there besides training up new ships. They get told that that's going to take them weeks or months right after buy skill injectors. There's no progression of self. That, that There's no path for them to take to gain a sense of mastery, to go from like, oh shit, I didn't know what to do, I messed up and died, now I know what to do, now I win. That, that is safer environment as well. So, Team Odyssey, right before me, they, they were talking about the first two items on this list, mostly. The narrative-driven gameplay and the helpful lessons. Now we are moving to the other two, where we engage with the player by providing them with choices and guidance for their decisions. So the choice itself, how to make it easier. The most important thing, just limit the number of options. If there's too many, then explanations won't help. More than three. And explain the consequences of the choice. choice Provide the paralysis. players the information, what they will gain by making this choice, or what might be at stake, what they might be risking by, by making this choice. And also... That's not the problem. The problem is new players getting killed by NPCs in high sec. It's super hard for us to explain what the fuck a fob is. That is not a problem. Players being killed by an NPC is not a problem. So the thing is, is that like when a player gets killed by another player, especially if they're in an area that they think is safe, they think that something unfair has happened, right? They think that the player has exploited or that, you know, th something, right? That there's, that there's uh, an issue here. And so they're going to blame the system for the fact that that happened. Whereas if an NPC kills you, you kind of have to admit at some point that you got killed by the by 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 the environment. There there must have been something you could have done about it, right? Like NPCs are in video games to punish you if you don't know, and to like so saying that 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 an NPC killing somebody in Eve Online is bad is like saying that an NPC killing somebody in Dark Souls is bad. I, I just disagree. It does hold true for the fr Triggs though, like. The thing is, is that if you die at a Rasnaborg, first of all, A, it te so here's the thing. By killing them with Rasnaborg, 
they know that there's a solution to their problem because it was an NPC that killed them. So they can look into the solution and they find out things like D-Scan. The behavior that they must do in order to protect themselves from the Raznaborg is exactly the same behavior that will help them against code. And thirdly, and this is real, they now have an enemy. Do you know how many people I know who are pro edencom because they got killed by a Raznaborg when they were young and now they want to kill every fucking triangle they find? More than a few. Keep them away from potentially regrettable choices. Like, do not... Like, try to keep them away from making a decision that they will regret later, and that applies to skills a lot. There are many players who regret training into mining because other players told them to do so. And People quit because it's boring. People quit because like there's no direction. Course. Dying to NPCs so, is a kind of direction. <laughs> no, I can't blame them. That's good, so, but I'm saying that's good. The feature that was introduced, uh, introduced in September was the first step on this road. Instead of expecting the player to pick one of 500 skills to train, we present them with a much simpler choice, which is who you want to be. Simple as that. And for, for diamonds them, are weird. Four options. Especially now that there's select, more things, the things more advanced than diamonds. When okay. they decide who they want to be, they can choose a faction they want to follow. So this puts an emphasis on the fact that the race of your character does not limit your possibilities. You can expand horizontally in skills for any ships or activities, no matter what kind of which race your character is. And you guys have been asking this for years, since before skill plans. You use the forums? Uh, Diamond NPCs, so uh, after incursions, when, uh, so incursions were just like really aggressive sleeper rats. Then they moved on to uh, making a, like pre, um, pre drifter AI, like in that transition, they, they started working on a new AI for things like fobs and all that stuff. And so to designate those as special, they put a little diamond on front, in, in the front of them. So the, the, the rats that were, uh, published during that time and with that logic, it's, it's, to, it's to specify to people that these are not the same as everything else running around. Interestingly enough, not all diamond rats are actually like stronger than other people or than, than whatever. And websites to share the list of skills with each other. That was great. However, yeah, they're designed to fight, the game a pl uh, you fight like a fleet. To get out of it to find some information. That increases the friction and breaks the immersion. Diamond and rats are supposed to simulate not fighting not players. Players like don't always carry, don't often carry loot. So since, since September release with skill plans, many organizations adopted um, them to help their recruits. This this was a tweet from Eve University. They have put together a great list of skill plans that are available true. both Thanks. to the members of the Eve University, but also to all the players outside of it. They share it, share them with everyone. It's Fair really point. good stuff if you are interested in. Seeing skill plans prepared for new players that are really well done, I recommend you guys to, to check that out. I've never seen that. That's so really in, good in each certified skill plan, we recommend a suitable ship fitting, so that instead of having asking the player to figure that out on their own, we give them an example to follow that they can use to, to modify or to learn what is really the correct fitting, so to speak, so they don't do dual tank or things like that. We have seen that as well on Zekiel. And just recently, we have fi fixed some discrepancies in those fittings. The fixes will be released in June. And then all of the f those fittings that are in the certified skill plans will match one-to-one -one with the community fittings that you can see in the fitting window, just to make things more consistent and easier and avoid confusing the players. So also, every, all certified skill plans try to lead you to content as well. They, they provide a link in the description that opens particular panel of the agency where you can find the content that we're interested in. But skill plans are useful not only for new players. I've been meeting with some of you this week, asking about skill plans, how you like them, how you use them. The response I got was usually, thank you for making it easier to manage. Skill plans are something that we, like the player base have not figured out skill plans yet. And it makes me really frustrated because um, it's within my own organization as other places too. I, maybe other places are doing it better. But the thing is, is that like skill plans the problem is, is that new older players think like, oh, I don't need a skill plan or whatever. But the thing is that skill plans are a tool for teaching because you can put things in the description of the skill plan. So you can give them a fit plus the skills it takes to be good at it and other things like that. And they can be packaged and shared. 
and be put in your corporation's advice or you can put the skill plan in with the fitting so they can go to the fitting browser and find the skill plans that are associated with it because you can put a description in a fit when you save it, by the way, and so that the, the description of the fit can link to the uh, skill plan. It's my 24 hours training. You are welcome. <laughs> it helps me too. They're, they're relevant to vets because it allows you to communicate no information to the new bros. If you became a capsule within the last few months, it's a communication been taken tool. Care of by air at the very beginning of your journey. They have put you on a special program so you could learn about and experience what there is to do for you as a capsuleer. Unfortunately, if I am a leader of an organization and I want everybody to train in munins, don't you think it'd be really useful to be able to link the fit and have that fit have the skill plans that it takes to do it built into it? including the support skills that it recommends you do. So it gives you like a bare minimum skill plan and then also the advanced skill plan. That seems like a pretty fucking useful thing for an organized co organization to do. Fortunately, that endeavor got interrupted by an explosion, no less. It does teach because they don't know. They can look at it. Now they know. What skills do I need for to fly the munin? These skills. Got it. Circumstances explaining things on the fly. And hopefully you have learned. I know, I know. I'm just Now the air, actual air carrier program can continue, can resume. And Air can introduce you to the available careers and let you learn them by doing. So what no, not teaching a vet. Program? Useful for it's teaching, useful for debt vets to teach. To skip that All right, is let me do Who I want to be. Then choose the activity you might be interested in. What I want to be doing. What I think will be fun for me in the game. And then choose the particular goal. What I want to do now. So this system, I described most of it yesterday, the system tracks all the actions that every player makes, takes. And for completing arbitrary goals, it rewards the capsuleer for that. It, the rewards are uh, usually relevant to the career the goal is associated with. So for example, if you fulfill a goal that's related to industry, then you may get a... Free expert systems. Industry. So what they're saying here is that when you comp so basically the way it works is like now when you complete the uh, the military career agent, they it, instead of just giving you the skill book and the in the in the destroyer, they also give you an expert system to kick you in while you're still training them. Additionally, uh, the system provides you with skill points, so you can accelerate the training. It offers a good visibility into what kind of activities are associated with specific they careers. Should. You can browse things and, and see for each career what kind of um, actions are associated. If I call myself an explorer, what does that mean? Oh, the there game? you go. That's why. What there's for me to do to then call myself I'm competent as explorer. Competent. Additionally, the system suggests the activities that are, ben that are beneficial to new players, fresh capsuleers. Then for each goal that you look at that, that you want to perform. It provides you with guidance from Aura. And that, that's an interesting thing. We think we have run some user research and uh, where we presented the players with the prototype of the system. You can just add a skill. And they liked it a lot that the Aura is back. You have a skill they, queue, they really so skill plans are just blocks of skills. What uh, has been part of what Team Odyssey were, were talking about. And they missed her okay. when that NPE. There you go. So they really appreciated seeing her back and helping them go through all of this. Also, or it should you be your source of all information. The goals for the sake of rewards, which are skill points, as the most important reward. Then you are kind of pushed into all areas of the game, where you can experience things that maybe you were not so interested at the beginning, but you may find them interesting after getting engaged with, with them. Of course, oh. this is not mandatory. Okay. It's all about Fair. your choice. It, also, this system gives you free expert systems that allow you to fly all rookie-friendly ships, so frigates Wait. and destroyers across all races, no matter which character race you are. And lastly, the system creates capable capsuleers who know what <laughs> to do wonder. and how to do it. So this is the choice of the career. It looks almost the same as in the skill plans. But in, additionally, each of those choices will be accompanied with some more information, both from Aura and in the form of a short video explaining what this career is about. At the very bottom, you can see your progress towards the skill point rewards. Because for completing every goal, besides receiving reward in form of ISK or modules or ships or skills or skins, you will receive 
career points, which are simply a system of measurement of your progress. We got XP, Both boys! Each of those careers, but also overall in the whole career program. Here you can see activities within the Enforcer career. Or I recommend you the activity that should benefit you the most as a new yeah, career, in this case. Have been for those. Go and do some career agent missions for start. They will teach you something. At the bottom, you can see the progress towards the graduation moment for this particular career. And graduation moment is when you complete 75% of all the goals that are designated for this career. And for that, you receive more skill points, but also skins that are related to, to this career. After selecting a particular goal, goal, you get the details of it, including the tips from our Aura on, on how to complete it. You can see in the bottom right corner, this is where Yeah, Aura you gain skill points at a fixed rate with some implants being able to adjust it. It provides you with more information about like, how do I do this stuff precisely. So a couple of examples. This is also something I showed you yesterday. So the reward section here showed the ISK and items that you will receive when you complete the task. Some goals provide you with the rewards that are outside of your race. For example, if you are an Amar. Oh, people were complaining because it's only 125,000 <laughs> ISK, but there's other things in there too. Fine. The skill book crate and boost. If you are an Amar, you will get Mean Matter skill books or Mean Matter frigates. If you are a Kaldari, you will you get... You just want to give us paths to take. Again, to make an emphasis, the fact that you can expand horizontally. The risk estimation shows you how likely it you is can of course always for you to do lose whatever a you want, right? By, doing, by trying to attempt to complete this goal. And the time estimation shows you how long it may take for, this goal, for you to complete this goal. So when you sit at your computer and you have half an hour, That's you really may good. reconsider which one to, to pick. Like I mentioned before, a career program provides players with 363 three million. And they are, they are the rewards for each of the uh, career agent missions. When you complete career agent missions for specific career, then you get an expert system that allow, enables you to fly all the ships that are relevant to that career within frigate and destroyer sizes. And there's about one million skill points worth of skills in those expert systems. That those are support Give skills. Give me all weapon system skills. Wrap so this example, all together. If you are on an enforcer path, and you get the expert system from the enforcer. It will give you skills for frigates, for Amar, Min Matar, Kaldari, and Galente, but also skills for uh, hybrid weapons, projectiles, missiles. I'm really surprised drones, we didn't find shields, we didn't armor, get like a all that full set. Seasons so to type expose thing. you to all types of uh, combat, all types of tactics. So then you can decide what to train. This is the list of ships uh, for each of the expert system that will be enabled. This should also help the recruiters to, to inform the you. Play, you the, choose which. The about what they can do. It doesn't matter what, what race you are, you can choose any of the races' paths easier, each stage. Um, to accommodate in the corporation. Just finish the career agents, you'll get an expert system, and you can fly with us immediately because you will have the skills required. So if there's you run a Mimitar, goals so far, grouped into 40 types of activities, and those If you run a Mimitar career agent, careers. you get Mimitar stuff. That's in total about 70 hours of content. So that's like a month wow. playing two hours every... What if... There was a hundred hours of quality content in EVE Online before you need another player. Today. That before you get need. the players engaged enough to get exposed to all the social aspects of EVE, to interact with you guys and get engaged more into the game. So what's next? I've shown you an interesting slide yesterday. about this. Okay. And I'm sure you will guys have some questions. We'll have a run table at one. We'll be talking a bit about this, if you will be asking about this. But to Oh, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the reason why there's no skill queue is because you don't train into a specific skill anymore. You just train, basically, you, tra you, you no longer train into specific skills. You accrue unallocated skill points over time that you can just apply to whatever you want. So you no longer gain, train into a specific skill, you just slowly accrue unallocated SP, and then you can just apply it just like you do now. Right, where are we going with this? We plan to rebalance all the skills. Well, implants can, and like every implant could just increase the um, amount that you're training or that you gain every period of time. And to reduce the level of complication uh, involved in the optimization of training, we are removing character attributes. 
I have a whole video called the worst MMO ever, even online, where we go talk about all those related. kinds of things. So we'll be revamping the whole implant gameplay, not only about learning implants, right? Exactly, Jita. All implants. Although I really like boosters. I will say more about that in a couple of slides. I like the idea of like having an implant. And finally, that helps skill you training train will be removed. Specific skills. No more training queue. No more training a skill. It will be accumulating skill points passively over time at a fixed rate. That Why would they need to, to amend the skills that we already have? We already have them. And then you will be applying those skill points either to. Wait, what? How on earth will they amend? No, it just keeps going. It's just we no longer train skill points. It just goes skill into unallocated. It's just no want. problem. So the skills will balance. will touch all aspects of every skill. Just to make sure that some of the skills that are 20 years old, almost, make sense for the players today and make sense in the context of all the yeah, other your skills. level 5 learning clone will just have the implants the character that attributes increase today your, your are training. Character attributes today are complex and complicated, but also obscure. The game doesn't tell you why one skill trains faster than another. That's a good point. Some of you know what is the training equation, but probably not all of you. And we'll yeah. just get getting rid of this that. This is actually a really decent path. More simple. Or, or so no, not complicated anymore, but it still will be complex for those who want to get deeper into it to optimize it more. It's true hunger, but or the sorry, implants, hunters, but as I said, yeah. they rely on character attributes, so we have to revise them. But uh, that ties to jump. It's not a tutorial. And today they cover too many subjects at once. They're saying there's 70 they are responsible for gearing up things to the do. same way you fit modules to ships. You also choose particular jump clone with correct implants if you are going into combat or if you are doing PvE. You, you know the entirety of Portal so 1 is a tutorial? Clones, but also the travel, the last level. that's another thing that you use jump clones for. And then on top of that we have skill progression, which is learning implants. So all those three things are involved in, in jump clones gameplay, and that's not ideal, because, because those things are not that related to each other really. So we'll be looking into some revisions in this area. And the training themselves, it's passively, um, as I mentioned, Icon. it's difficult to, to understand or to explain why some skills are, take longer to train than the others, how all of it makes sense, what are attributes, what are attribute remotes. Merle, I'm not saying why that they have to go through 100 hours, hours, but that there is 100 hours of engaged gameplay for them, that the game isn't awful to play without running into other players. So if we are removing the training queue, that means you will be left with skill plans as the the tool for you But if to you plan want direction, the there's 70 hours and worth of direction. The training queue wasn't ideal for that e anyway, because it That's didn't tripping. allow you to, to plan without commitment. And what I mean by that is you had to buy the skill book first to, be, to inject them, and only then you could add them to the training queue to see how long it will take for you to achieve a particular skill, to be able to fly that ship. Now, skill plans allow you to do that without commitment. You can just add the skills and see how long they will train. Players aren't getting bored because they're getting skills too fast. To That's not an issue. So we had, since we'll be removing the training queue, we had to give you skill plans first. That's when this whole journey started for our team. Our game is becoming PvP mode? What are you talking about? The PvP doesn't for necessarily change. I recommend you all to come to the run table if you can. For Team Odyssey and Team Equinox, it's embracing new citizens. Hopefully better than if. that, Rockin. Thank you very much. What Nomad just said was very important. Let's go back and listen. Start, uh, to start training them or not. And only then you could add them to the training queue to see how long it will take. Wait, wait. And the training queue wasn't ideal for that e anyway, because it didn't allow you to, to plan without commitment. And what I mean by that uh. is you had to buy the skill book first to, be, to inject them, and only then you could add them to the training queue to see how long it will take for you to achieve a particular skill, to be able to fly that ship. Now, skill plans allow you to do that without commitment. You can just add the skills and see how long they will train. Only then you can decide to buy them or not, to start training them or not. So we had, since we'll be removing the training queue, we had to give you skill plans first. That's Got when it. this whole journey started for our team. So like a skill plan is just like a baby skill queue. And that is it for Which now. Which is true. I recommend you all to come to the run table if you can. For Team Odyssey and Team Equinox, it's embracing new citizens in if. It's also Thank the reason why alphas don't have a limit anymore, because it's like, what, what the fuck is the point of a limit at that point, right? That doesn't even make sense in that paradigm. All right. Well, that was that one.